Good morning, everyone. If I can ask you to please take your seats. We're going to get started in just a minute here. I just have a couple housekeeping announcements before we begin. Um, first off, someone left their hotel key and some other item at their front registration desk. We have it here at our registration desk, so if you're missing any of your possessions, please check there. Um, second, I do ask that all cell phones remain off or in airplane mode. Um, if you need to take uh, any meetings or calls for work, we ask that you step outside and you can use um, the space back behind the other room. Um, the, the noise will be picked up on our microphones and this is being webcast to well over uh, 2,000 people so we'd like for them to be able to hear everything. We do ask that you turn your cell phones onto airplane mode or off. Um, again, you are welcome to step out. We do ask you to please stay away from the doors. The sound will come in and echo and again, we don't want people who are joining us remotely to pick up your side conversation. Um, Welcome to the CMS eHealth Summit. I will be passing it off to our acting director of the Office of Enterprise Management in just a moment. Um, we do have Wi-Fi access again. It is a little tricky. I ask that if you need help with that, again, step outside to the registration desk and we will help get you set up. Um, otherwise, uh, just a quick housekeeping announcement. Um, the cafeteria is open. Lunch is from 12 to 1. We do ask you to be aware that if you leave campus, you will have to come back through security. So please plan that into your timing because you'll have to come back through that line and be searched again if you're re-entering the building. Um, with that, I will pass it off to Niall Brennan. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Thank you, Beth, for the uh, introduction. Uh, and welcome to the uh, fourth uh, CMS eHealth Summit. Uh, we're very happy you joined us today, whether in person or remotely on the webinar. Uh, a lot of people on the webinar, I believe, uh, well over uh, 2,000. Um, as Beth said, uh, there's an hour for lunch, and if you do leave campus, it might be a little bit of a hassle. It might be worth it, though. There's a, uh, an institution around here known as Pit Beef, um, a Baltimore institution, and one of the best Pit Beef stands is a mere five minutes away from the CMS campus, so it very well might be uh, worth uh, clearing um, security again. It's called Pioneer Pit Beef, and uh, I will be happy to give people directions, or I'm sure other people would. So I think like anybody who's like remotely close to CMS should try it at least once. So um, as many of you know, um, we are, um, uh, we connect multiple programs that are working to create a more safe, secure, efficient, and patient-centered healthcare system. And we're committed to working with you to align these efforts and accelerate quality improvements in healthcare through these programs. We're very excited about today's panel discussions, which allow us to focus on important e-health issues and highlight lessons learned and best practices for implementing our initiatives. We'll hear from experts who will discuss a range of efforts, including administrative simplification, information governance for healthcare, quality measurement initiatives, care delivery, and payment reform. But before we begin these discussions, I want to take a quick step back and look at where we're going. Let's see if I can figure out, oh, it worked. Um, so across CMS, our goals are improved quality of care, better health outcomes, and reduce costs for both providers and patients. E-health is a vital enabling component of this roadmap by creating secure transmission of data, increasing participation in health IT, and promoting value-based payment reform. Some of the programs include the Medicare and Medicaid EHR incentive programs, programs that I'm sure you're all very familiar with over the last three or four years and have resulted in um, $25 billion in incentive payments going to both Medicare and Medicaid providers. Quality measurement programs like the PQRS program, administrative simplification initiatives, accountable care organizations, and the many, many other Affordable Care Act and Center for Medicare and Medicaid in Innovation uh, care delivery initiatives and major progress on um, both internal and external data analytics and data exchange. 
The EHR incentive programs are driving hundreds of thousands of providers to not only adopt an electronic framework for patient information, but also use health IT to capture and track health information electronically. At the same time, admin simp is reducing paperwork and the business burden on physicians. This is the type of program alignment which, which we hope will drive improvements in care delivery. But at the root, these programs are policy decisions. So how does the policy help drive train, change? We use our policy and programs as levers. Admin simp, EHR, meaningful use and interoperability, electronic quality measures and health information exchange to standardize data and incentivize useful data exchange. This in turn ensures the overall goal of the e-health programs to align health information technology and electronic standards programs ultimately leading to improvements in health outcomes and a higher quality healthcare system. We're all planning now for the future of the healthcare industry. Implementation of these programs and initiatives mentioned today are allowing us to successfully and continually evolve healthcare delivery and payments. Today we'll hear from experts about new models of care delivery and payment, patient provider incentives for better outcomes and more efficient care align payment with performance. In turn, they encourage better care coordination, higher quality, and efficient care delivery. All of these discussions are part of an important dialogue between CMS, healthcare professionals, and the industry. We at CMS know that active, collaborative discussions with you are absolutely essential to successful impl implementation, and we are working to promote this type of ongoing engagement. So once again, welcome. Um, we hope to gain insights from the various panels today. We hope that you gain some insights from the panels today, and uh, we will certainly um, thoughtfully consider uh, all the insights uh, and information that we hear today over the course of the summit. So thank you all very much. I'd like to turn it over to the first panel, which is Health IT and its impact on care delivery and payment reform. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to our first session of the day titled Health IT and its Impact on Care Delivery and Payment Reform. This session is being led by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, or CMMI. My name is Ahmed Haq, and I'm the Senior Advisor at CMMI and will serve as this session's moderator. The format of this session is moderated Q&A. Our panel this morning consists of leaders from federal and state governments as well as physician leaders from group practice and health system settings. With that, I would like to introduce today's panel. Dr. Larry Garber is a practicing internist and the medical director for informatics at Reliant Medical Group, a member of Atreus Health. He's had decades of experience and success in medical informatics. Dr. Garber is the chair of the Massachusetts eHealth Collaborative's Executive Committee, a member of the Massachusetts State Health Information Technology Council, and a member of ONC's Policy Committee's Health Information Exchange Workgroup and Privacy and Security Tiger Team. He also co-chairs the ONC SNI Framework Longitudinal Coordination of Care Workgroup, which is used as evidence-based approach to update the HL7 Consolidated CDA to better meet the needs of care transitions and care planning. Dr. Kevin Larson is the Medical Director of Meaningful Use at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. In that role, he is responsible for coordinating the clinical quality measures for meaningful use certification 
and overseeing the development of the population health tool. Prior to working for the federal government, he was the chief medical informatics officer and associate medical director at Hennepin County Medical Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He is also an associate professor of medicine at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Larson graduated from the University of Minnesota Medical School and was a resident and chief medical resident at Hennepin County Medical Center. He is a general internist and teacher in the medical school and residency programs. His research includes healthcare financing for people living in poverty, computer systems to support clinical decision making, and health literacy. Dr. Karen Matsuoka is the Director for Health Systems and Infrastructure Administration for the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, where she leads the state's strategic planning and policy efforts around population health improvement in Maryland. Prior to her service for the state of Maryland, Dr. Matsuoka served as the Research Director for the Engel Engelberg Center for Healthcare Reform at the Brookings Institution, where she managed a diverse health reform portfolio, including issues pertaining to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, implementation of health reform at the federal and state levels, as well as health IT and its applications for clinical quality improvement, payment reform, performance measurement, and evidence development. Dr. Matsuoka earned her doctorate in philosophy and master's in philosophy in social policy from Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar and her BA and MA are from Stanford University. Dr. Margot Savoy is the medical director of the Family Medicine Centers at Christiana Care Health System. Dr. Savoy also sees patients at the Wilmington Job Corp Center, juvenile detention centers, and school-based health centers, and she rounds on inpatients at the Wilmington Hospital. She completed her residency at the Crozer Keystone Family Medicine Residency Program after residency, she completed a primary care faculty development fellowship at Michigan State University and earned a master's degree in public health from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I would like to kick off the session today by asking each of our panelists to provide a brief opening statement explaining what connects you with new care delivery and payment programs, what are some key drivers that motivate you to be part of these programs, and what key health IT processes are needed to realize greater efficiencies in healthcare? We'll start with Dr. Garber. Thank you. So I've been a practicing internist in central Massachusetts for 28 years now. And through my entire career, uh, more than half of my patients have been in capitated risk sharing contracts. Um, all of my, almost all of my elderly patients are either Medicare Advantage or uh, part of the Atrius Pioneer ACO. I have about 5 to 10 percent of my patients as Medicaid managed care patients. Um, most of my commercial patients are in pay for performance contracts. So currently 80 percent of my patient panel is capitated at risk. Now we're a multi-specialty group practice and our singular focus has been to keep patients as far away from the hospital as possible. That's been the key to our success. Keep them healthy, keep them in our hands, we can control costs. And so my salary has always been um, modulated and modified by the quality of care that I give, by the satisfaction of my patients that we measure regularly, and by the health care costs uh, for the patients that I care for. So if I keep my patients happier and healthier and keep their costs down, I, I make more money. And that, that motivates uh, all of our physicians and staff. So we've been, we've been very successful at this. We have some of the highest quality uh, scores in the country. And it's my belief that if we change how all physicians and facilities are paid in this country to more of a pay for performance model instead of fee per service, uh, we'll do a great service to our country. Good morning. Thank you guys for having me here today. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm from Christiana Care Health System, which is located in Newark, Delaware, which is in Newcastle County. Um, part of the reason that, um, from our perspective, we think that um, the triple aim is so important is because most of the people who work at our institution are our community, and so we're not just taking care of 
random people in the world. We're actually taking care of ourselves and the community that surrounds us. And so in a lot of ways, um, Christiana Care thinks it's very important to be a little outside of the box and a little transformative because small changes make big deals in Delaware because we're not that big. And so a little ripple in the pond quickly becomes a tsunami depending on who starts it and how they decide to start it. Um, one of the exciting things, at least in my role, is that um, we had the pleasure in our practices of being the first NCQA certified patient-centered medical homes in the state and the challenge of trying to convince other people that checking off boxes is more than just checking off boxes, that it really does require rethinking the way you practice care, rethinking the way that you're going to deliver that care, and then helping patients to understand it. Um, from my perspective, if, if no one takes anything else home today, um, there's two or two things that I would like to get across. One is that um, doctors aren't robots and can't enter five million things during a visit and still focus on the patient. Um, and two, patients aren't robots and can't read 10 pages of information in small font about things they don't care about that don't help them to get their health care together. Uh, HHS, uh, which is CMS and uh, the Office of the National Coordinator of Health IT, along with a number of other agencies like CDC and FDA, uh, have a strong commitment to improving the health of the people in our country. And we view the adoption and uh, use of electronic health records as one of the building blocks, one of the stepping stones to getting there. Uh, why do we view it that way? Because we've seen from leading places in the country like Larry's, uh, like other parts of the country, uh, that that has actually really uh, happened. So one of our goals at uh, HHS is to really help support the widespread adoption and deployment of health information technology across the U.S. as one of these first uh, important steps, like Dr. Brennan uh, mentioned, in getting to a new kind of healthcare system that uh, really promotes value, promotes coordination, promotes health. Uh, meaningful use as a program is just uh, a start. It is not the end all and be all. It is the, the place that we start and it is a way to um, help um, uh, assure that uh, some key attributes are uh, present in practices and in um, communities across the country. Uh, why did I get into this? Uh, I realized that healthcare uh, information technology was one of the change uh, agents of my time. The healthcare industry has been much slower to adopt electronic uh, information than many other industries have for lots of good reasons. Uh, but when you see it happen, like I've had the luxury of seeing it happen, it is truly transformative to health systems and truly transformative to patients' lives. And so it's because of its power in uh, connecting people, getting good information to um, patients to make decisions, getting good information to providers to coordinate care. Uh, that is the reason that I got into health information technology and the reason that I'm uh, practicing the federal government. Good morning, I'm Kara Matsuoka, as um, Ahmed mentioned. I'm the director of the Health Systems and Infrastructure Administration for the state of Maryland. Um, and this is a relatively new unit. We were created in the summer of 2012, specifically in anticipation of health care reform implementation. But we were also strategically placed um, to spearhead a lot of our transformation efforts in Maryland within the public health department um, for all the reasons that our speakers on this panel have already said, the importance of health care for health promotion for population health. And certainly from the public health department's point of view, improving population health as one part of the triple aim has always been very central to um, the core functions and vision and mission of what the Department of Health does. But as we started to utilize the rich data that we have throughout Maryland from our great infrastructure that we have, including a burgeoning all paraclaims database, a health information exchange that connects all 46 acute care hospitals in Maryland with live admissions discharge transfer data feeds on a daily real-time basis. We started to see and confirm in our own data what the research has been showing for a very long time, which is that if you really want to do a really good job of population health improvement, you can't get there without better health care without data to facilitate better care coordination, primary purposes for data sharing like that, but also for important um, secondary purposes of, of data like performance evaluation, performance monitoring, um, program evaluation. Um, but then also critically important is, um, as the, the other speaker mentioned here, is making sure that whatever strategies we're putting forward um, 
meet the patient's needs. So the experience of care as part of the three-part aim is a huge important driver of what we do because when we looked at our data, we started to see that there are a lot of strategies that we were putting forward in Maryland that while well-intentioned, weren't really addressing the root causes of what we're ending up to be the primary drivers of a patient's avoidable hospital utilization. So by better forging, um, designing models that better integrate care, that address the root causes and primary needs of patients, Combining that with payment reform models like the global budget that our first speaker talked about so that all the healthcare partners are then incentivized um, in the right direction to improve care and lower cost. And then partnering the healthcare system with other strategic important partners like the public health system, like social services, like the school system. All the partners that are going to be really critically important to helping us address all the non-medical needs that drive healthcare utilization among whom we call the super utilizers in Maryland. Um, we know from our data that simply providing better care within the healthcare system alone is not going to be enough. So as we're thinking about the strategic use of data in Maryland, in addition to everything that these speakers have said, which are critically important, the other thing that, that we're doing in Maryland is to try to um, allow the data to flow across systems and sectors. So to the extent that we're trying to better integrate services between healthcare system, the school system, social services system, and public health system, that also necessitates that data that are collected independently in these different systems are also able to be um, to flow across the systems, to be linked with each other, um, to enable care coordination, not, so, not just within the healthcare system, but across all these sectors that are going to be critically important partners to better health promotion. So for all these reasons, um, Maryland is very much um, focused on payment and delivery reform models, innovative ones like the global payment model that I'm sure you'll hear about later today. Um, but then also, how do, we, how do we use this data and make sure it gets to the right people who can then act on it, um, certainly at the state level, but also at the community level as well? Thank you very much. I'll start out with the first question of the day, which is participating in these new care delivery and payment models is requiring the capture of quality and administrative data in ways that have not been done before. How is this data being converted from information to knowledge to better manage the health of the population? We'll start with Dr. Garber. Well, I think I mean, we've been very successful with this, and I think the key to our success has been the fact that we have a single uh, electronic health record with extraordinarily good patient engagement tools. Um, and tightly integrated into that EHR is a, some data analytics tools and reporting tools, um, as well as a robust rules engine. And by having all of these, uh, we can you know, rapidly uh, elucidate knowledge from the data that we have and turn that right back into the workflows for how we care for our patients. And it, this only works if you have access to all the information on the patients. So we put a great deal of effort into health information exchanges to make sure that we capture all the information and deliver it to where it's needed at the point of care. Um, but we also recognize that you can't expect to get clinical data from, from all the places that care is given. And so we actually also access the claims data uh, on our patients and load those directly back into the EHR. So it's not just the data warehouse, but we take the claims data and populate our EHR on a weekly basis. So we're not waiting for it to be staged somewhere and six months behind. Every single week I get claims data and load it. Uh, in fact, prescription claims we load on a nightly basis. And, and with this, we populate uh, the medication list. I know when patients are filling their prescriptions in a day after they've actually picked it up. Uh, we also have, uh, we populate health maintenance, so if someone gets a mammogram or a colonoscopy across town, even though I may not be interfaced with them, that shows up automatically in my electronic health record. Immunizations are automatically populated regardless of where they're given. The last diabetic eye exam is automatically populated. And, and by doing this, when I get an alert or when a registry shows up that a patient is overdue for something, they truly are overdue for that. And we can focus our energy on making sure that those are taken care of. Your system sounds very nice. Um, so what I would say is that we're in a more of a transition stage. Um, so we do have a data warehouse. Um, in Delaware, we're fortunate enough to have a Delaware Health Information Network, which allows information from the different hospitals and labs and radiology sites across the state to feed into one space. 
we're still working out the details of sort of getting that information into the EMR in a way that doesn't overload the primary provider with having to sign off on 100 documents from patients you may not have even seen in a while and what to do with all that information. Um, one of the things that um, I find most striking and interesting about the sort of new new data that's being collected and how we're asking people to collect it. Um, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, is the idea of structured data versus unstructured data and putting it in a field that you can search for and be able to find. And I guess I'd never really given a lot of thought to how many different kinds of ways people can store the same bit of information so that you take something like an A1C that seems really straightforward to you because it's a lab, it's a number, it's really discrete, it's, it's one number, and yet one person stores it one way and another person stores it another way, and when you run your report, you get neither, and so you think the patient hasn't had it. And so it's been very interesting to see sort of how in Delaware, as they're trying to make this information network, how they have to get all of the, not just the EMR vendors, which is a whole other ball of wax, but all of the hospital institutions that want to call it the same thing and everybody to want to be speaking the same language, which is a challenge in and of itself. And then even amongst our practices, I mean, we have employed physicians, but we have a very large medical, medical dental staff that isn't employed by Christiana Care, and they can buy whatever EMR they want. And so you have to be able to also interface with them, which is an entirely different challenge than just sort of getting us to all be on the same EMR because we all work for Christiana Care. And so it's been very interesting to see how they manage that data. Um, it's also been interesting, you know, I'm, I sit here in the midst of a power chart upgrade for the inpatient, which started yesterday, or start, oh, today's Monday, it started today, um, and a centricity upgrade that starts next week. And so, I mean, at this moment, our doctors are acutely sensitive to the fact that all of these things are changing, and there's all these fields changing, and all of a sudden you want me to use Dragon and dictate and do things that I don't normally do. And so it's been very interesting to see that most of the providers are not against, I mean, I know we see the messages every day against all of the changes. What providers are against is that patients spend a lot of time telling us that we spend a lot of time with our face in the computer and not a lot of time with our face in their face and listening to them and hearing what they have to say. And I think that the sort of idea about these structured fields and the challenges of having to put the data in the right spot means that a physician is spending time during their visit not just thinking about what the patient is saying and trying to hear them, but also making sure they've actually put the data in the exact right spot so that somebody's happy at the end of the day. And that's a really difficult thing to ask to do. And if you all of a sudden have to hire a scribe or a nurse to make sure the data gets in the right spot, all of those savings that you just sort of collected just got lost in another salary and in another person having to be there to make that happen. And so, you know, I don't know if there's a Siri for EMRs coming anytime soon, but <laughs> there's just, there's a real challenge. And so I think that, um, it's interesting that the data is there, and it exists in a lot of EMRs. I mean, I know we've been on the EMR for over 15 years now, but getting it back out is a challenge, and it's not nearly as simple as, as, as it seems like it should be. Um, and I think that once we figure that out, all of a sudden doors will open, and, and a lot of people will be having the experience like what you're describing, where they really can in real time know what the patient needs, what the patient actually could use to be able to make their life better. And in fact, maybe the patient could even access it from home and become in to already engaged to talk to you about it as opposed to having to wait for you to give that information to them. So imagine you have a car and it doesn't have a dashboard. It has no speedometer. And instead, after you drive your car for a year, uh, three months later you get a letter in the mail that says, last year you went 65 miles an hour on average, that's too fast, please fix it this year. That is the position most physicians face in understanding and getting feedback about quality of care in their practices. The data that's used is aggregated, uh, often on an annualized basis, given to them anywhere from six to 18 months afterwards as a one-time number, and often in discordance from the various sectors that give it to them. Each insurance company gives their an independent report. Um, it's very hard to do the kind of course corrections you need to do as a practicing clinician to really make the, the, the changes that you need to make. Most doctors I know absolutely want to do the right thing for their patients. They want patients to be better. They want patients to be, have good health. So part of our challenge is to, to figure out what these guys are talking about and getting good information at the hands of doctors in an easy to use way that those doctors can take that as input and, and and unleash their ability to do really good care improvement. Um, that, as we've heard, is a challenge in our currently fairly heterogeneous healthcare market, uh, where the data is, is distributed among many different actors and players across the system. The data is in many different forms and formats. So a primary goal of ONC is to work on standards-based interoperability. How do we figure out what are the right standards, 
get those standards deployed as much as possible and have people sharing that information back and forth to really unleash lots of creativity and power that exists in people across the country. Um, uh, ideally, that's done with as low a burden as possible, but as we've heard, that um, it, there is a transition phase, and all of us are having to change during that tr transition phase. Uh, I know from the days when I worked in a health system, I had the very same experience where we th said, let's, ma let's see how, um, how many, uh, let's really track how well our doctors are handling referrals. It took us a year to understand that we had 19 different approved methodologies for referrals within one health system. And we had to figure out how to measure 19 different ways of communication around simply the, the fact of referring. Um, so we're facing that not just at a single health system level, but in a nationwide level. And we are really working to find, again, these standards-based ways to say that the technology that you purchase and put in your office has a number of the features and attributes that let you do this. Additionally, we're working with a number of uh, private partners uh, and other uh, governmental partners at figuring out what the data infrastructure should look like. This shouldn't, we shouldn't have to reinvent a new kind of data infrastructure each and every place at each and every state in each and every location. So we're looking to uh, figure out how we can align around quality measures. You'll hear some discussion around administrative um, simplification as well as alignment around measurement. Uh, those are big priorities for us to really help that uh, lessons from one state like Maryland be applicable to another state if that other state would like it because the standards are similar enough and the data flows are similar enough that they can learn from one state to another or maybe even deploy technology that was uh, uh, useful in one place to another place. Um, as the, the representative of a state, I, I think I kind of fall in between some of the challenges that Kevin's talking about and some of the challenges that we hear on the, the far end of the panel. And I think one of the strategic things that we're at least trying to do in Maryland, and I know that there's a lot, you know, more progress to be made, but one of the things that we're trying to do is to try to, where we can at the state level, where there might be efficiencies, to be able to foster some of those linkages and, and integrations and interfaces so that practices don't have to reinvent this practice by practice. If, if the state can sort of take the resources that we have at the state level and do that once, and then you know make that more simple for practices to then kind of plug and play into an overarching state infrastructure, that's sort of one of the strategic aims that we have. So for example, I mentioned um, we have the health information exchange called CRISP, and we have 46 acute care hospitals that are currently submitting live data feeds um, in a real-time basis right now. So um, initially, that, that infrastructure was started out just to kind of take in this encounter data for purposes of what the hospitals were doing that, that they have been doing for decades around um, Maryland's very unique all-payer hospital rate sitting system. Leveraging that very same infrastructure though, we were able to take that encounter data and um, find mechanisms to then repurpose it for primary care coordination purposes. So for example, let's say you're one of the 10 Medicare approved ACOs in Maryland right now. As a practice, you can tell Chris that this is your patient panel that CMS has said you're, you're responsible for these Medicare beneficiaries. You can send that list of patients to Chris, and any time one of those patients on your list shows up, is either admitted, discharged, or transferred in any one of the Maryland 46 hospitals, that primary care provider or practice can receive a ping in real time to say that your, one of your patients has shown up. You know, you might want to start discharge planning now because we know that you know, your, your likelihood of achieving shared savings under the Medicare ACO program might be better if you were to start discharge planning sooner rather than later. So that's an example of, you know, an infrastructure that a primary care practice, if they tried to do that on their own, could have taken a lot longer time. But because at the state level we had sort of an infrastructure in place, it was a s relatively small incremental cost to then make it do something just a little bit more. Um, using that same data, we're now able to do um, encounter reporting um, services. So for example, we can now map where various different um, hospital utilizations have taken place so to see are there hot spots around Maryland where we see a lot more utilizations than others. And maybe those are the, er the places where geographically we might want to focus more of our resources, more of our efforts um, relative to others where we don't see a lot of avoidable hospitalizations. Um, and because this is encounter data at the patient level with addresses, we can even drill down to the actual individual block level and see for every individual person, um, 
individuals who are utilizing the hospital seven, 10, in some cases over 100 times in one year is what our data is showing us and say, um, you know, use that as a signal event to try to figure out what is it about the healthcare systems that's not structured well enough to take care of this patient so that the patient is manifesting in these um, repeat avoidable hospital utilization. We're also trying to do things like, um, right now the CRISP is where all the two private labs send lab data already. Um, so using the same kind of logic, you know, that lab value information sits within CRISP. And so rather than having every lab or every practice have to figure out how to recode and normalize the, the data, because it sits in CRISP, CRISP can kind of do it and then send out reports, and to Kevin's point, not on a payer by payer slice basis, but we can say for this entire patient population for whom you're responsible for, regardless of the payer source, regardless of you know, disease, however you wanna segment the data, we can create that patient profile for you. So if you wanna know of all your diabetic patients that you're responsible for, how many have their A1Cs under control versus not, we can give you that information with the data that we have. So those are some of the um, kinds of things that we're trying to do at the state level as sort of buffers between um, leveraging all the great work that Kevin and his shop has been doing and, and certainly the standards work has been hugely important in enabling us to do any of this. Um, but then kind of taking those resources and doing things at the state level that we can do much more economically than if we had to have every practice kind of do it on their own. Thank you. The next question is, how can health IT be used to risk stratify patients and develop care plans to reduce health care cost for the highest risk patients? Dr. Garber? So what we do is we first identify our, our highest risk patients. Uh, so we have a, a, a tool in our data warehouse that estimates the likelihood of hospitalization in the upcoming six months based on the prior year's claims. Um, we also look at patients who have had frequently, frequent ED visits in the, uh, in the preceding 12 months, uh, patients who have had uh, recurrent 30-day readmissions in the preceding 12 months, uh, patients who were discharged in the preceding two weeks from the hospital, and patients who are currently in SNFs. And review, we review that list um, every two weeks uh, with the primary care physician, uh, several of our colleagues, uh, a few nurses, care manager, and starting in a couple months also behavioral health nurse practitioner. And we talk about what uh, medical treatments could uh, be done to perhaps prevent the problems or in, that have existed or are about to happen um, and what other services uh, may be beneficial to the patient. And then we update those into the care plan uh, which is in the electronic health record that we all, we all share. And so we do something somewhat similar using patient lists. I guess the best example I can give you is with our diabetes management. Um, we have a diabetes care coordinator whose um, primary focus is just to work on the patient list that we sort of give him in the office around people who we need to be seen. So he can do phone outreach, he can do in-office outreach, but the beauty of it is that he's physically located in the office so that we coordinate with him. So I could have a visit today, I could see the patient, decide that I'm concerned about them, and then hand them off to him, and then he can hand them back to me if he's talking to them in between visits and feeling like they're still having problems. Um, what we decided to do was use, instead of waiting for patients to just present to the office with diabetes, we decided to use, similar to what you're describing, the list. So we run the list to find out who are the high-risk diabetics. So everybody who has diabetes doesn't necessarily need to be working with the care manager closely, but there are a group of people who really needed a lot of intensive care, and so we started with them. And then as we sort of got them better controlled, backed up and started to go after other folks. And at this point, we're actually now working with pre-diabetics and sort of linking them with the YMCA and some of their programs that they have. And so that it's sort of been very nice to start with a small group and then sort of expand out and expand out. Um, and it's nice in our practice that because we're an academic practice with residents and medical students, you actually get a little bit more flexibility to try some new things. And it was kind of nice that we had the opportunity to sort of start it in our practice and then they rolled it out sort of how you were describing efficiencies of scale. So, you know, we started it in a fairly small practice, but then eventually rolled it out across the health system, which then made it much easier for other people to institute the same thing without having to reinvent the wheel. They didn't have to rerun reports or figure out something new. They could run the exact same thing just on their patient population, which was really helpful. We see a lot of ways that this is working right now, and, and I think you guys have really described uh, one of the primary ones that most places are using, which is leveraging the data they already have on utilization and care outcomes to identify people that 
uh, either have had a history of high utilization or are likely to have a history of high utilization, so both retrospective and kind of prospective uh, assessment, uh, but also to look at people that have big care gaps. So and that's one of the beauties of quality measurement is you can understand what people are supposed to be at and then see who isn't there. And that lets you target your interventions at groups that have big care gaps. And so I think those are some um, tools and resources that are currently available to nearly any provider that has an EHR now that they can look backwards into their practice, see who didn't meet their quality metrics for whatever period of time they're looking at, and who w was seen a lot uh, either in their own practice or in other places. Uh, but we also are seeing other ways that this is happening. I think another key one are some uh, consistent assessment tools that are starting to be used uh, across the care system. One of those is called the care tool that many of you may have heard of that uh, looks to do uh, some very specific kinds of assessments of patients to understand what patients' particular uh, strengths and potential uh, needs are so that those can be consistently communicated across care settings. Uh, so for example, as a patient is discharged from the hospital to go to a nursing home or long-term care, if we are consistently sending uh, what kind of care needs they have, uh, likely re likeliness of falling, um, issues with how many uh, people they need to assist them, those are the kinds of information that we have known for years has really helped us do planning and helped us keep people uh, living healthy at home with the right amount of supports. Having that as data now instead of just on a form or in just instead of just in an assessment lets us scale this across a practice or across a regional uh, setting. Um, we're also seeing some, some more sophisticated tools where people can use this data in a, in a kind of big data way, uh, looking at the uh, information and in assessing your likelihood of cardiovascular risk and how much cardiovascular risk we've actually modified using the current sets of treatments that we have. So really starting to think in new ways about uh, sophisticated ways to use our data. Um, and I think one of the most interesting ones I heard is out of the group uh, that's doing the, the Camden Clinic activity, where they're talking about what they call market segmentation. So instead of doing uh, our work and analysis in the way that we've often done, which is based on clinical trial analysis and retrospective healthcare data analysis, think about how a business does it. And what a business does is they do market segmentation and they divide their group according to kind of um, uh, flexible ways of knowing how people might interact with that business. So uh, I think an example of this is some work that Kaiser did uh, identifying who had not yet um, in their Northern California practice achieved high rates of uh, hypertension control. And by looking at their data, they found that it was African-American women uh, going to OBGYN practices, and those women were typically under the age of 40. That was not a group they had historically targeted for most of their hypertension uh, uh, work, but by looking at that particular part of their market and understanding that that was a place where there was a, some untreated hypertension, they then developed a program specifically targeted at OBGYN practices for hypertension management that supported those OBGYN practices so the OBGYNs didn't have to necessarily take on hypertension, but they, they added some additional help into those practices to really focus on a key area where, they, where there was opportunity to improve uh, uh, health and an important um, uh, health care condition that leads to really drastic outcomes. So I think there are lots and lots of opportunities. Uh, additionally, we're starting to see some activity around looking at what kind of ways we can systematically collect data around social determinants of health. There's currently an IOM committee that is, has released a, an interim report uh, on the behavioral and social determinants of health that may be collected in EHRs. So uh, some practices, again, are starting to do that, looking at what other things like health literacy or um, language spoken in the home might also be important things to know as we think about how we uh, target uh, interventions for certain groups or people. Before you do, um, one of the things that you said actually just struck me because I, I didn't think to say it, and I'll bet you do the same thing. One of the really interesting things about having the data in the office is not just the people who were seen, but the people who weren't seen. Mm -hmm. So that um, most of the time, not seen means that you must be okay from a doctor's perspective. So if you're not calling and you're not coming in, you must be good. And it actually turns out that a large number of the people who were out of control were the people who we hadn't seen in a year. So they had no number or their number was super high 
you probably fussed at them during the visit, then they never came back, and you didn't have any trigger or radar to make you bring them back. And so it's been fascinating to see the people who you actually totally missed them because they just disappeared from off of your radar screen, or you referred them to a specialist and you sort of stopped thinking about them because they were now seeing endocrine, when in reality endocrine thought you were taking it back and they thought you were managing it and you sort of missed out on that opportunity. And so seeing who hasn't been seen has been just as important for us as seeing the people who are coming in and have data. Actually, I'll just I'll add to that. So what we, we do is for each of our patients across the population, we look for what their actionable deficiencies are. You know, so what's, you know, their A1C is too high, they haven't had their eye exam, they haven't come in for a visit, whatever. And so we add up all their actionable deficiencies and come up with a score called the barometer of actionable deficiencies, or the bad score. <laughs> and so the patients who are the most bad sort to the top and we call them first. It's really interesting. Um, in Maryland, we're kind of doing um, a hodgepodge of a flavor of everything that has been spoken about here. Um, and in particular, I think, harnessing the data that we are privileged to have at the state level that individual practices, practitioners, or organizations might not have access to um, that we do because we happen to be at the state level. So for example, um, all of our hospitals, like every hospital in America, are, are very much ramped up for the readmissions in, in response to this, the Medicare policies around readmissions and payment. Um, but one of the things that we're able to do in Maryland, because we have a broad infrastructure that we can um, leverage for hospitals, is that we can see what the patterns of usage are between, not just within a hospital, so when a patient is discharged from a hospital and then gets readmitted back to that hospital, but we can also see the pattern of usage between hospitals. Um, and it's that sort of, um, the missing information that you might not have that often is the critical information that you really need to have. And if you think about those kinds of information gaps within healthcare, but then broaden it out to all the social determinants of health. So for us in Maryland um, in January, we were approved to have this, this brand new experiment around hospital payment where in the next five years, every hospital in Maryland has agreed to go on a global budget. So that's setting all sorts of new kinds of financial incentives into play and behavior changes on the ground. Um, to be successful under this waiver, clearly we're gonna have to figure out how to um, improve care for who we call our super utilizers, many of whom have certainly complex chronic conditions that need very high quality health care. But um, what we're often finding with this population is that no matter how good the health care is, if it's not integrated with all the other social services and support, the wraparound supports that are very hard for a primary care practice to do alone, like in the case of a child with asthma, the home remediation, if there's a pest problem in the home, that's the kind of service that is very difficult for a primary care physician to do, but which public health does all the time. So are there ways to link these services and systems together um, while appearing seamless from the point of view of the patient, but to provide this comprehensive kind of service that can address not just the clinical determinants of someone's health, but also all the social determinants of health that the healthcare system alone is probably not going to be able to do at least very efficiently, and primary care providers you know, already have enough to do. So as we um, unfold this greater service integration on the ground, there is the opportunity then to merge also the data. And I think a lot of very interesting insights are going to emerge probably from that exercise. Um, because we're going to, if we thought that there were important in, you know, gaps of the things that we didn't know that we really needed to know in healthcare data, imagine what those gaps are and the, and the utility of the, the missing pieces and insights that can be gleaned if you can also enrich that with social services data, public health data, education data, housing data, all these things that we know are important for health. Thank you. I'd like to ensure that we have enough time towards the end of the session for questions from the audience. So these next set of questions, I'll ask our panel to limit your responses to about two minutes or less. This question is specifically for Dr. Larson. In your role at ONC, you are close to much of the policy and standards work related to certified EHR technology and electronic clinical quality measures. What work is being done at HHS to align quality measures across new care delivery and payment reform models or programs? Uh, so this has been a high priority for the, the whole department. Um, our national quality strategy goals for this year are aligning uh, our programs for measurement, aligning our measures, and aligning our federal programs with state measurement programs. So it, it is a high priority. We have a, a lot of active work to do. 
uh, and we have been doing quite a bit of that work. For example, we looked across our portfolio of diabetes measures and discovered across the department we had nearly 60 measures in diabetes, and we pared that down to a core list of about five measures that we're implementing across our programs in HHS. Um, some of that is going to take a while for the rest of the world to see because if you follow federal rulemaking cycles, you know that when we make decisions uh, like this in the government, it takes two or three years for those to end up being the ones that you're, you're living under. We also are working very uh, closely with partners in the private sector around measurement alignment. There's a group called the Buying Value Coalition, which is sponsored um, uh, or housed under the National Quality Forum. Uh, we just had a couple of meetings here this last week where we're working on the same kind of alignment of measures, not just at the federal level, but also with private sector partners like health plans to figure out how we can come up with a core set of measures that would um, be the starting place in most locations or for most programs. Um, uh, on top of that, as you mentioned, we have standards. We are working to continually improve the measures we have and the standards that support those measures with the ultimate goal that that measurement is a low burden exercise and it's an attribute of the EHR that you have so that the, you spend most of your time on improving care, um, but that you have the tools in your lap and in your office to actually uh, see the care that you're giving and understand where your opportunities and care gaps are. Great, thank you. Next question is for Dr. Garber. What are some key health IT components that are needed for, to successfully implement and operate an accountable care organization? And I've got an hour to answer that, right? You have just about <laughs> two minutes. Okay, so uh, obviously a, a great electronic health record. Um, the patient engagement tools, you know, people automatically think patient portal, but it's actually a lot more than just the patient portal um, because you're not going to get a heck of a lot more than half your patients interested in, in going online and working with you. So you also need other ways to access them. So whether that's automated mail systems, interactive voice response systems, and also home health monitor device monitoring uh, systems. So for instance, we have 200 patients right now who uh, take their blood pressures at home and plug it into their home computer and it gets uploaded directly into my electronic health record, which is really convenient for everybody. They don't have to call in. We, no, no nurse has to write it down. Um, so that, that works out nicely. Um, another thing is, you know, we need to, you know, have great health information exchanges that work well and automatically. Um, you know, you can't expect people to manually push information to you. You need to set up subscription models where information automatically gets pushed to you. So for our, all of our hospitals in our region, we let them know who all of our physicians are. Their computer systems look up and say, oh, you're the PCP, automatically sends me through the health information exchange information on my patients. The fact that they arrived in the emergency room, the fact that they had tests and procedures done, I get all the test results, their lab results, imaging, I get procedure reports, discharge summaries, all sent to me into my electronic health record. Which brings up another thing which is really important is that you need to be able to control the flow of information that comes into your EHR. So all those labs and radiology reports from the inpatient all file silently in my EHR so I have access to them when I need them. Um, but the fact that someone showed up in the emergency room goes to my in-basket. The discharge summary goes to my in-basket and that of the care manager so that they can see them. For We also have uh, rules built into that so three days after discharge if someone doesn't have a follow-up appointment, my appointment secretary gets notified that they need to book a hospital follow-up. So that, that routing is incredibly important. Um, I talked about claims data. Um, Decision support, we also talked about the registries for the bad score, uh, analytics. I mean, these, these are all important tools. But, I want, but the most important thing, as I said, you need the data, and it has to happen automatically. You need hassle-free HIE. Um, well, our patients, when they show up in the emergency room, uh, they not only do I get that ADT notification, but that triggers my electronic health record to send back a summary document directly to the hospital automatically so that 30 seconds after the patient registers in the emergency room as a byproduct of that registration, the ER's electronic health record shows my summary. Fantastic. Thank you. Next question is for uh, Dr. Savoy. The Christiana Care Health System provides care for patients across multiple state lines. How are you coordinating this care, and what is the role of health IT to make this happen? So this is one of those critical moments. So Delaware is 
is perfectly located to have patients and providers in every state around the circle. So we have um, practices in Jersey and in Pennsylvania, in addition to in Delaware and Maryland. And so sometimes a patient could be your patient, but then when they get admitted to the hospital, they go to the hospital closest to their house, which happens to be in Maryland. Um, and this is one of those times where there's sort of a two-fold approach. So for the practices that are Christiana Care employed, the beautiful part is that everybody's on the same EMR. So the specialists are on the same EMR, the primary care folks are on the same EMR. And so while it's a bit of a tricky moment about who owns which parts of the chart and who can move things like problems and medications, at the end of the day, it still helps that everybody can see the same information at the same time. They can see notes without having to wait for somebody to fax it or to wait for it to show up. It's just in the chart, which is beautiful. Um, but from the outside part, so that when you get to things where people show up in other hospitals, this is where I think the state information exchanges have been very helpful. So I told you about DIN and how we have our Delaware Health Information Network, but I know they have at least one hospital already in Maryland, and I know they're working closely with now that Maryland, Maryland has an exchange that's set up, having a way that Maryland's exchange and Delaware's exchange talk to one another. Um, because it becomes an issue not even just for hospitalizations, but also things like immunization records. So the number of kids that bounce back and forth across state lines and then their immunizations go into a black hole is actually astounding considering that it's 2014. And so the idea that you could, you know, actually tap into not just your record, but any provider's record and then any health department, because a lot of kids get their shots through the health department, or even the pharmacies who can now report through the immunizations into the um, health information network, things like that where you can actually have like huge scale savings without having to have five people calling the parent having to hunt, thing, to hunt things down. And so a lot of it um, for us has been coordinating, so actually having open conversations, recognizing that patients are sometimes going to not be at your hospital and be at the other hospital, and being willing to have that conversation that you're not actually actively trying to steal patients from across state lines but that sometimes they live near you or they work near you, and so they're going to end up at your hospital. And if we share back and forth, it actually saves us both a lot of time, money, and energy. Thank you. Dr. Matsuoka, over the last couple of years, you've noticed a significant growth in the number of both Medicare and Medicare, Medicare and Medicaid care delivery and payment reform programs being implemented in your state, including the Maryland all-payer model that you referenced. What synergies, if any, are there in these new programs, and where are the health IT intersections? I think, um, as you mentioned, Maryland is very fortunate to have a lot of things going on. Um, and I think one of the things that we're trying to do as we're kind of um, helping to coordinate the transformation efforts going on statewide is to deliberately strive for the synergies because it's becoming more and more apparent that it's not going to be the ACOs by themselves that are going to you know, fix the problem. It's not going to be the PCMHs alone that's going to fix the problem. It's not just going to be the global budgets that the hospitals are going to be paid, paid on moving forward that's going to fix the problem. It's going to be a both and approach as opposed to an either or. And so the effort now is to um, leverage all the things that are happening and coordinate them so that we're reducing any kinds of duplication of efforts that there might be. So for example, a lot of these efforts, um, a lot of the, in terms of the IT infrastructure and the architecture of that infrastructure is kind of the same. You know, the, you can do a lot of the different, you can have a lot of end uses germinating from the same architecture and the same infrastructure. And so one of the ways we're trying to realize synergies and reduce duplication is to say where there can be a shared architecture, let's use it, let's coordinate that way, and let's leverage each other's resources to make the limited the dollars that we have go as far as they can. So one of the things that you mentioned, for example, is this um, global budget program, the all-payer hospital payment model that was, um, that's gone into effect earlier this year in, in January. Um, that so that's a very powerful set of incentives um, in play. I mentioned before that um, every hospital is going to be on a global budget. In addition, the hospitals have agreed to um, cap the rate of hospital growth to the rate of inflation and to promise Medicare alone, um, not, a, not even, you know, let alone all the other payers, but Medicare alone, $330 million in savings. So that's a very tall order. Um, Finding a way to encourage the activities underway as part of that waiver and link them in with the PCMHs, the ACOs, because we know that hospitals alone, they're not going to have enough of the tools and the resources to control um, and keep all their patients well and outside of the walls once they're discharged from the hospital. That's really going to require better linkages between the hospital system and the primary care system and the public health system. And so forging those linkages and realizing synergies that way 
is a key component of, of what we're trying to do. And as we're sort of planning things out, I think we see them not only as synergistic, but almost necessary parts of a single strategy. So you might imagine that we have all this great work underway in Maryland, um, just under the state innovation models work, for example, or we're trying to build what's called community integrated medical homes, where you've got PCMHs that are also empowered with wraparound services and supports to help primary care practices better address the non-clinical social determinants of health for their challenging patients. It's going to be very difficult for the entire healthcare system to move in that direction if you have sort of hospitals in one sector continue to be paid on a fee-for-service basis and penalize when they decide to partner with their community and um, prevent the avoidable hospitalization. So the payment model, the global budget payment model, is almost a necessary financial engine for everything that we're trying to do on the delivery side. And they're almost um, two necessary parts of one whole. I don't know that the community integrated medical home could work without hospitals partnering with them. And at the same time, I don't know how hospitals are gonna be successful under this new waiver and meeting all those very ambitious financial tests without having this robust and comprehensive approach to primary and community health to kind of um, helps hospitals meet their targets. So in those ways, it's sort of a necessary synergies, but also, I think, um, deliberately, deliberately orchestrated so that we have the synergies that we wouldn't be able to realize if these were independent efforts that were kind of going about it all in their own kind of silos. Thank you. And in your opinion, what will drive future health IT innovation? Dr. Garber? Payment reform. I agree with that too, but I also think simplicity so that um, what I've noticed is that what vendors say and what vendors provide are not the same thing. And I, I don't know if they're speaking the same language as CMS and ONC, but things that should be very simple from my standpoint get made very complicated when they get handed off to the vendor. And what they provide me and what I think you intended don't look anything alike. And so the, one of the examples we were talking about this morning is that part of our upgrade for our ambulatory EMR is sort of getting us ready for stage two um, submission and our clinical data summary. So what used to be a patient instruction sheet that was at best two, maybe three pages long, started off with the patient instructions that I was giving the patient for that day, has now turned into a six page document full of stuff that I don't think most patients actually want to read or care about. My instructions are now the very last thing on that document because that's what the vendor thinks that you thought that you wanted them to say somehow. And at the end of it, what I thought was really interesting is that I showed I showed the document to patients because I've been working on patient engagement in our office. And I got to say, they were like, well, half of the time I threw away the other one you gave me because it was too much information anyway. If it was really important, you would have said it to me. And I don't understand why it's not on my cell phone. And not that portal thing because I don't feel like logging into it. And how come you can't just send me a text message when I'm supposed to go get my labs? Why do I have to log into anything? And so things that like, you know, I, it's funny, I think about it, I grew up with a computer, so for me, computers are not that big a deal, and having one in my pocket doesn't really bother me, but it's surprising to me how many patients are the same way, and the things that we offer them from a health IT standpoint, well, I know where we're going. From a patient's perspective, they don't match what's already in their pocket for the real world, and so they don't see why these things are valuable, and if we could find a way to sort of accelerate that growth and help the vendors to accelerate that growth, I mean, if they had the same, I guess, input as Apple, maybe they would feel differently about it because they'd have more people trying to buy their product. But it's just interesting to me how what gets said and what actually shows up are not the same. Yeah, I, I would say consumers, I think, are really going to drive the next round of innovation. And um, I think it, especially some kinds of shared decision-making tools. So an example of this um, is a, a registry system where patients can track their own disease symptoms. And then when they and their own um, uh, response to treatment for chronic diseases that need a lot of um, changes. And then they can go in and talk to their provider and the two of them can look at this together and say, hey, it looks like when I took my pain medicines I didn't actually get pain control. Or it looks like when I took this medicine I didn't actually get better function. And by having that set of shared tools, uh, that allows the consultative uh, practice to really uh, respect the patient, but both of them to be using data to really drive good decision making and then ultimately that g gets the whole system more knowledgeable because then we can aggregate all of those people's various experiences and we understand new things about which treatments work and which treatments work for which kinds of people. Um, and, and I also as data uh, like the data CMS just released on provider costs become available across the country, the types of tools that consumers will have to use that data I think is going to be a, a rich place for innovation. 
I would um, definitely agree with payment reform. Um, if you if you structure the way that um, the financial incentives in such a way that um, it requires the the use of health IT and new tools to be able to do the better job, I think that's that's what's going to give the provide the business case for health IT innovation. I also think from um, a policy point of view, what drives innovation is being very clear about the goals and being very flexible about the means. Um, but then also, I think in, for two reasons. One, I think um, not every tool is going to be um, valued the same way to different consumers, to your point. And so it's hard to know specifically what a patient's going to find valuable versus a clinician, and a clinician in one place and a clinician in someone else might value something different. And so um, tools that um, enable physicians and consumers to do the same thing, but enable flexibility around how you develop applications to meet the needs of the end consumer, I think is very important. Um, and I also think that it's important in a different, in another sense too, and it comes back to the consumer point of view, which is um, in healthcare, healthcare markets tend to be very unique kinds of markets in the sense that consumers don't always necessarily, consumers meaning patients, don't always necessarily have the buying power that they might have in other markets. And so, um, and in this case clinicians too, in terms of the, the kinds of products that they might want to purchase. And so, um, in order to keep the innovations affordable, I think it really um, being flexible around the means and not specifying a lot of things that can add cost to the end product that vendors are developing that may not add value to the end user is a way to keep costs down um, while ensuring a minimum level of functionality um, so that any, any purchaser can be con assured that the product that they're going to be buying can, can do certain functions. But then the end user can then choose, you know, this style or this format is the one that's going to be most beneficial to me. That drives competition based on value while exerting downward pressure on costs. And I think all these things kind of have to come together um, to really have a very um, fertile kind of marketplace for health IT innovation to bloom. Thank you. Well, I have several other questions, but I'll stop here and open up the floor and give our audience an opportunity to ask any questions that you may have. We do have a microphone out um, in the room in the middle. So if you can please line up and ask your questions and specify which presenter you'd like to answer your question. Well, I don't have a particular presenter, uh, Shauna Koss, uh, Connected Health Resources. I'm glad you finally came to the consumer, but uh, as Ligia from ONC has said, 85 to 90 percent of all health is determined outside of health care. And sadly, the consumers still feel like the last mile in health IT so, and, and aren't necessarily engaged in these wonderful services and applications that they're being um, encouraged to use. So um, if you had to do something today that would really empower as opposed to just engage the patient, what would that be? And, and what are you already doing to really put, it, put the information in their hands to do as they see appropriately? I mean, what I will tell you that I find, and I think my practice may just be a little bit strange, um, I actually find that many of my patients don't necessarily want their data in between in the volumes that people seem to think. Most of them actually want me to sit down and explain to them what's going on. And so as we've transitioned to using the portal, which I'm really good at selling stuff, so like I like IT, so I'm like, you know you want the portal, you want an email from me. And so they'll get it, but you know what, they still come in for a visit because they read it and they read what I wrote, but what they really wanted was to sit down beside me looking at the computer to talk about what does that mean and what do they want to do with it. And so part of, you know, when I really think about what we could do today or what, what we could implement today, I think part of it would be going back to the beginning and what you mentioned about goal. Like, what is the goal? So if the goal at the end was that we wanted patients to be educated consumers of their own health and we wanted providers to be the sort of user interface to the health, health system in general, and we want HIT to be the vehicle that people use to get everybody to there, then we have to back up, I think, a couple steps sometimes and really think about what we're trying to do. So do you really want me to click off the box that says I gave the patient a patient instruction sheet, or do you want the patient to actually understand what the instructions were at the end of the visit? Because they're not the same thing. And sometimes I can get so wrapped up in trying to click off all the boxes to make the instruction sheet look correct 
that I don't have enough time to sit and talk to you about what I actually wanted to say. And I think that's the part where patients are complaining that we're not really engaged with them and then we're not talking to them because the part that you used to spend just talking to them, you now go into another room or you're engaged in the computer trying to click off boxes, which I think is the challenge. And so if we could find a thing that we could do right now, I think it would be sort of refocusing on that communication part and making the IT work for you as opposed to you working for the IT, which is why I think things like your iPhone and your, you know, your tablets work for you because you don't just get an app. They don't show up, they don't show up and give you 50 apps you don't want. You pick the ones you want. You pick the version of the calendar that works for you, not the calendar that they make you have to have. And I think it's that kind of idea. And I'll add to that that we have to remember that patients are people too. And, and that they have busy lives. And so in addition to everything you said, we also focus on the convenience. Um, so, you know, my patients can go online and directly book appointments onto my schedule, or they can ask me questions or get re renew their medications. And so it's a very convenient process. And, and they can use smartphones to do that as well. Yeah, I, I would, just additional thought that it, consumers in this country are very diverse. So it's not gonna be a single solution. It's gonna be lots of different solutions. And I think a number of people with chronic diseases view health as a sort of necessary, important investment of their time. Uh, but many other people would rather not spend that much time and thought on their health and health care. They really want that to be a, uh, something that happens nearly automatically most of the time. So I think there's going to be a whole range of kinds of ways to engage consumers uh, based on what their particular needs are and values and goals are. And that's where the big opportunity is going to come is people figuring out again in like in a market segmentation way. I'm managing a lot of chronic diseases for my mother and I'm helping her manage, you know, 50 medications. I need tools to do that, but I don't want them to take tons and tons of time. That's a really different thing than than um, someone who goes into the doctor once a year and the dentist once a year who wants just an occasional reminder on their uh, calendar that's integrated to the rest of their life. Next question. My name is Gail Osgood. Um, I just spent a lot of time down in West Virginia and here's the kind of situation we have. We have centers that are highly integrated such as Charleston or let's say Lewisburg and then there are areas that are just sort of fallen off by the wayside where there's nothing like for example Summers County where you have small towns like Hinton which barely have like a thousand people in them and and they're scattered all around the hillsides and they're not very coordinated uh, for them to take for these poor people who are relatively well uneducated, and that's putting it politely, for them to take off and get health care in the first place, they have to take off the, from their jobs, which are, and if it's a good job, they like work at the Dairy Queen every day, or the, or the local uh, um, Magic Mart, and they, take off for the day and they go to see the local uh, physician and somewhere between a half an hour and 45 minutes away from where they live, or maybe it's an hour and a half, depending upon what hill they live on, such as Brooks Mountain. And it's difficult for them even to get the basics of health care. They just sort of fall off on the wayside. So we have these areas that are highly integrated, areas that are not. And when I listen to them, when I, when I go, I have a, a home there. And when I go home and I listen to them, and I listen to them for hours on end, um, here's, what they, here's what they generally tell me. They tell me that they wish that there was a way that they could contact, that they could contact their doctor um, over the internet. And of course, by over the internet, they mean what they're talking about is going to the local library and using the internet, which is their primary way of accessing the internet. And so one of the things that like I've heard about what you're describing is people using telehealth or being able to use, I'm so this is still HIT, yes. but that they actually do it with a slightly different model so that you, and this comes back to being able to integrate with the state or with larger health systems, but what I've heard about people talking, and I don't know if they've, they haven't done it 
quite in that way in Delaware yet, but they're sort of doing it in small pockets. But where you actually have a health system that will, you know, you set up a center where the people are able to go. There's a big monitor. You dial in to wherever you, you know, whoever you're calling in to see that day, and you're actually able to have your whole visit. And a lot of times they'll even put it in a company. So if everybody's working at the Dairy Queen, then maybe the Dairy Queen has a central location where people all come so that if you had to go, you don't actually have to take the day off of work at all. You walk into room A, you dial into whatever that's sort of put into place, and then you're able to have your visit and your consultation. But that kind of, that kind of coordination comes back to what you were talking about, which is the payment reform. Nobody's going to pay for the, the fire optic network and all the other stuff that it would take to do that if nobody's going to get paid for the visit that happens through that telehealth ability. And I've been hearing more and more about that, at least well, in Delaware, with like not, our upstate, downstate. It's not, just, it's not just in West Virginia that we're hearing this. We're hearing this in rural Kentucky. We're hearing it in, in Louisiana, in Missouri. In well, we hear about it even in not rural places. So there are a lot of working people in Wilmington, which is not rural at all, who still can't take the day off of work to come. But if they were able to log onto their computer, talk to you for 15 minutes to get what they need to do and not miss the day, they would welcome that because they would actually get their care done. I hear that a lot from working women who don't necessarily have a lot of time off. So yeah, and I just want to put a quick plug in for the regional extension centers at the Office of the National Coordinator of Health IT. So one of the things that we've focused on is exactly the people in those areas. And that is a really key target and an important group of uh, Americans. And so we have worked hard to uh, over-represent our work in supporting the practices, getting to health IT in those very rural areas, in the frontier areas across the U.S. And we've made really terrific, terrific uh, progress, and they are at nearly the same level of health IT adoption as urban areas are in the U.S. There are pockets in the cities that's, that still don't have health IT, but, but we have worked hard and focused specifically on critical access hospitals in rural areas. Thank you very much. I'd like to conclude today's session, um, and I'd like to especially thank all of our panelists. Our, our panelists will be available for a few minutes after this session um, in case anyone has questions afterwards. But I'd like to pass the mic over to Beth Myers for um, our, our next session. And I, I oops, there we go. Uh, thank you. I appreciate uh, the panel. Thank you so much for joining us. That was really, really an excellent conversation. Um, and those who do have questions, I encourage you to, to continue the conversation. Unfortunately, I want to keep it going, but we have to keep on our schedule. Um, we do have a break now, though, um, so I'll let everyone go briefly. Um, please come back. We will start on time, even if you are not here yet. I do ask that if you are having conversations and answering questions at the break, um, please don't do it right in front of the doors, because I will shut those doors and start immediately at 11. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, uh, some of you may be involved in social media. If you are, um, our Twitter hashtag that we use for these events is CMS eHealth Summit. So that's hashtag CMS eHealth Summit. A follow-up on that, um, it may be tempting to take pictures or to tweet things that you hear from others in the room. I ask that you be respectful. This is webcast, so all of our panelists and all of us who are asking and answering questions. We know that that is all public, but don't tweet something from your neighbor without asking them. And please refrain from taking pictures. Um, we are actually not allowed to have photo and video equipment on CMS campus without prior approval for security reasons, so please don't get me in trouble. Thank you. Come back at 11. Thank you. That was great.
If I can ask everyone to please file in. Sorry about the jokes too on my phone. I wasn't kidding, we would start at 11. So please file in and take your seats. I can ask our panelists to take their places. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. Please take your seats. And we will get started with our next panel uh, entitled, It's All About Quality Alignment. And with that, I will pass it off to Daniel Green of our Centers for Clinical Standards and Quality. Thanks, Beth. We'll actually bring Beth out in a few minutes to uh, assist down here. I'm kidding. She's uh, <laughs> cringing at the thought. So I'm a medical officer here at uh, CMS. I work in the ambulatory Care Division, the Quality Measurement Health Assessment Group, uh, medical officer there. I work on the PQRS reporting programs, uh, meaningful use, um, peripherally, excuse me, work on the value modifier programs. Uh, and um, so happy to have with us uh, our distinguished panel today. We have uh, Dr. Rosemary Kennedy. A lot of initials after your name. Wow, it's <laughs> she's done a lot, needless to say. Uh, Dr. Kennedy is president and CEO of eCare Informatics. She holds many leadership roles through her work with the American Medical Informatics Association and Technology Informatics Guiding Educational uh, Reform Board. She's widely presented and published in the field of nursing informatics, clinical documentation, and terminology standards. Dr. Kennedy is a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing, where she received the HIMSS 2009 Nursing Informatics Award as well as the top 25 women in healthcare award for 2009. She's currently on the Tiger board and sits on the safety council for the American Association of Medical Instrumentation. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Kennedy. Uh, next, we have uh, Daryl Roberts. <clears throat> Dr. Roberts uh, has been a registered nurse for over 20 years and an evaluation and analytics scientist. He, uh, he's been an educator as well for over uh, tw uh, 10 years. His expertise incorporates informatics, uh, healthcare quality, and public policy. He's had an effective interdisciplinary research career conducting clinical, sociological, and psych psychiatric studies that evaluate the effectiveness of public policies, information technologies, and research methodologies. Dr. Roberts' work has been published in numerous scholarly journals, and he's presented at research and professional conferences internationally. He currently holds the position of senior researcher at uh, Econometrica, a Bethesda-based federal, federal contractor, uh, after two years serving as a senior policy fellow with the American Nurses Association. Dr. Roberts, thank you for joining us as well. And last but certainly not least, <clears throat> we have uh, Rolinda McFadden. Um, and we're, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, Rolinda. <laughs> Uh, she is a quality specialist for the Arkansas Foundation for Medical Care, so the, one of our QIOs, um, and that is the QIO for Arkansas. Uh, she has more than 20 years of nursing and healthcare experience, uh, including 10 years in the healthcare quality improvement, fo focused specifically on primary care physicians. Uh, she joined the uh, AFMC in 2005, and she's been providing hands-on support support to Arkansas physicians in selecting and implementing electronic health record uh, systems. She's incorporated quality improvement methodologies also to assist physicians in documenting, monitoring, and improving outcomes in their uh, practices. Ms. McFadden specializes in clinical workflow optimization and redesign to maximize the use of EHR functionality and incorporating evidence-based clinical quality measures that align with federal and state initiatives. This would include the Arkansas Payment Improvement Initiative, uh, the PQRS, thank you for your help with that, uh, as well as the uh, Medicare and Medicaid EHR Incentive Program or Meaningful Use, uh, the Patient-Centered Medical Home, the Comprehensive Primary Care Initiative, the Arkansas Clinical Transformation, and Physician Value-Based Modifier Programs. She maintains professional relationships with state and national organizations to ensure insight and understanding of healthcare, health IT trends, and regulations. So uh, please join me in welcoming our panelists. Okay, so we have a busy uh, hour here, so let's uh, get to it. 
Um, our first objective is to analyze the state and the science of uh, HIT uh, facility quality measurement and improvement. So, um, uh, Ms. McFadden, if I may start with you, can you tell me what are the things I should be doing in my respective organization to maximize the use of HIT to improve quality performance? Well, as you said, the majority of my focus is in the primary care setting, specifically in rural, in, in the rural parts of our state. You know, we look at what is going on within them. You know, 52 counties of our 75 are actually considered underserved counties. So that's where we primarily focus our efforts in improving their utilization of their healthcare information technology. We also know that from the Arkansas Academy of Family Physicians, we only have 1,000 and 1,200 physicians who are identified. Of those 1,200 physicians, 715 of these are actively practicing. Of those 715, only 429 serve the rural areas. So we know that these are the providers that we want to focus on to ensure that the majority of our state population who actually lives in the rural community gets the health care services that they need. You know, we understand that the EHRs within these practices should have staff that function at the maximum of their licensure so that they can capture the data that is necessary at the point of care. You know, we understand that by 2025, Arkansas will be the fifth leading state in the nation with the highest volume of geriatric patients. And so we're looking at making sure that patients get the care that they need at the time they need. Uh, thank you. Uh, Doctors Kennedy or Roberts, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I, I think there are four major areas in terms of um, what activities that entities could do within their organization. And I think in some respect they mimic what we did in a national level um, related to the meaningful use measures. Um, currently I am working with many sites um, integrating measures within the electronic health record and workflow processes at, at the point of care. And I'm seeing a lot of similarity between the activities going on within those projects and, and correlation with the activities under, that went underway in terms of the meaningful use quality measures. I think one, the first thing is it, it doesn't really start with HIT. So getting the evidence-based practice entities together and alignment about um, evidence-based guidelines and care for populations of patients. Whenever we start to talk about one specific measure, let's say VTE, it's not just that specific measure and what it's looking for, but it's how do we care for this population of VTE patients. I think the uh, second area is role definition. Um, I know um, up until a few years ago I worked on the front lines and sometimes I didn't always know what the radiologist was doing in the radiology department. Um, so some discussion of role definition. We are finding that as we discuss the meaningful use measures or any quality measures for that matter, uh, amazed at what different caregivers do that the other caregiver may not know based on um, the workflow. So I think the second is role definition in support of evidence-based guidelines. The third area is the data flow. Where does the data come from and how is it flowing through the system? Uh, most entities have disparate systems where data aren't all stored in, in one particular system. So understanding the data flow as it relates to um, quality measurement and then the workflow. Where are the data captured at one point in the workflow? So I think those four areas um, apply to pretty much every quality measure, any quality measurement initiative where you're trying to use health information technology. To add on to what uh, Rosemary just said, I think really one of the biggest drivers behind all this is that we have a much more involved patient community than we've ever had. We have younger patients that are pushing the envelope. We have older patients that are glomming onto that in an unprecedented way. We have folks like my dad who's 74 years old who uh, was using email back in the early 80s and is now pushing his providers to make sure that they keep him up to date electronically. He was one of the earliest users of the blue button technology that, I, that I'm aware of outside the VA. Um, in fact, um, there were a lot of conversations that, uh, that I brought up in public comment during the Health IT Policy Committee meetings about these blue button technologies and making them easier for the patient side. Um, they don't work that well on the provider side and on the patient side it's even more challenging. 
Um, these drive, this is a driver that I think is, is very, very motivating, that we have patients now that really want to know, they really are engaged to know, and even if it is only 5%, 10%, it's those leading indicators, those, those early adopters that are going to push everyone else to move even more quickly. Uh, and I think that our focus on providing patients with what they need based on what they're saying they need, not what they need based on what we think they ought to need, is something that's driving our practices forward today. Great. Thank you. Those are uh, all outstanding points. Thanks for enlightening us with that. Our next question, um, and I may take a stab at it myself first, spare you guys. Uh, describing a best practice example showing how quality measures can be used within EHRs and workflow. So working on the Meaningful Use Program and working on EHR uh, method of reporting, if you will, for the physician quality reporting system, you know, our vision for these quality measures, we're not doing this, if you, <clears throat> if you will, to try to uh, keep more work on the uh, caregivers in their practice. My wife's an internist, and I hear every night how much work she has, and um, you know, usually out in the doghouse. But having said that, the um, what we're looking to do with this is obviously we're looking to improve the quality of care. All doctors think they're providing good quality care, but sometimes when you actually measure something and say, okay, well, what percentage of your patients actually receive their influenza shot? They're thinking probably 90, 95 percent, but in reality. Maybe it's only 75%. And until you see those numbers, you may have to go back and dig and go, well, the numbers are wrong. We didn't capture the folks that got their shot at Walgreen or whatever. That's understandable. But they still it took the physician or the caregiver to go back and look and research why he or she is only coming up with 75% when they're thinking they're 95%. So until you give somebody that kind of actionable information, they're going to just go along thinking again that all their patients are, and I'm using flu, but getting their, getting their flu vaccination. At the same time, what can we do, and aka what can you guys do to help your caregivers, and again, I'm speaking and focusing more on the ambulatory care uh, setting because that's my, uh, the bulk of my experience, but you know, what can you do to help your um, uh, physicians and other caregivers improve that number in case they really are only around 80%? And that's where the point of care reminders come in. And if it's integrated, and again, using influenza, it's pretty simple, but um, using those point of care reminders uh, at the time the care is being delivered is certainly a heck of a lot easier than having to call or notify your patients, hey, you need to come in for your flu shot. So, you know, a patient comes in, they uh, have a nasty spider bite. Boy, we'll get really exotic here. You know, on their hand, you're focusing on the exotic spider bite on the hand, not thinking necessarily about flu shot. Maybe tetanus shot, but not flu shot. But again, if it's during the flu season, what a great opportunity. And if the EHR can help facilitate that workflow to remind, if not the physician uh, herself, perhaps the nurse that's working with them, or even somebody in the, in the front part of the office. So having like taken that whole question, guys, <laughs> I'm going to see if there are any other comments. So again, we're looking for best practice showing how measures can be used within the HRs and also with the workflow. I'd like to follow up on something you said, Dr. Green. I think clinical decision support on the front end, not just the back end. Um, the quality measure, if you do back end reporting, you know um, what may have gone wrong but you really want to move it more upstream and influence it on the front end. And two concrete examples of, of projects that I'm working on, and this is not meant to be prescriptive, just descriptive. Um, one is in an ambulatory-based practice, an IRB-led study where patients are engaged in their care delivery. So before they leave the office, they enter information into a kiosk and basic questions. Do you understand your medications? Did you provide input into your plan of care? And do you know what that plan of care is? And the physicians are really floored with the reports that are fed back to them at the end of the day. They're looking at them saying, D gee, John Smith is fairly intelligent. I thought he or sh he understood his medications. That information then automatically gets fed back at the end of the day to a care coordinator so somebody can intervene real time at the point of care. Seventy-eight percent of the patients are leaving with no understanding of their medications and feeling like they had no input to their plan of care and they don't understand what it is. And it's not 
that they don't want to, and the physicians on the fly are changing their behavior, looking at the end of the day saying, okay, tomorrow I'm going to do A, B, and C. Um, a second best practice example, going back to your point at the point of care, is on the acute care side. Um, the American Nurses Association, we're working on a de novo measure that's been built from the bottom up using data standards. Um, quality data model, it's represented the measure authoring tool, it's using all the HL7 standards. Um, putting those data standards in place when a nurse assesses a patient as to whether they're at risk for a pressure ulcer within 24 hours, we can actually kick off some clinical decision support. So if they don't do that assessment, they get alerted. And if they do do the assessment at the facility that I'm working at, they're able to automatically generate a plan of care to prevent that pressure ulcer, which is important because it costs Medicare $1.9 billion, um, each hospital up to $700,000 uh, to treat uh, a pressure ulcer, something that is certainly avoidable. And if you consider the fact that the existing pressure ulcer measure that's being used at CMS underreports by about 90%, uh, and that's not inaccurate. Uh, that means that we really need a better reporting mechanism. The development of this measure is really going to drive that. Um, a second piece to that, and um, you see I work for Econometrica now, but a few weeks ago I worked for the American Nurses Association. So, um, Aside from that, the Office of the National Coordinator last year uh, awarded a three, three different companies uh, app awards for creating a handheld pressure ulcer measuring tool uh, for iPhone. And uh, this tool, one of the things that ultimately ANA would like to do is incorporate the data collected in this tool into that e-pressure ulcer CI measure that Rosemary was just talking about and really driving mobile health into the measurement arena so that we're actually able to capture the data at the point of care using an easily uh, not uh, interfering uh, data capture mechanism that has a camera that actually uh, has the capability of measuring the wound uh, with several photographs uh, and incorporating that into the quality measurement system. These, these are the types of innovations that I think are going to drive healthcare forward. And uh, that pressure ulcer measure, while it's just one, is um, extremely valuable and it provides the base upon which other measures are going to be built in the future. And moving back towards the ambulatory care aspect, maximizing their EHR functionality so that when they are documenting the immunization for influenza, they know exactly where to document this is an important factor. And what we see across our state is every system is different. You know, and just because you document it in structured or in uh, text format does not mean it's retrievable. So educating the nurses, the physicians, the nurse practitioners on where this documentation should be captured is a priority for us and making sure that we can monitor that with the outcomes of their data. You know, looking at, you know, the, the standard, standardization of their documentation makes it a much better place for them to practice. Great points. Thank you all. Uh, which is a nice segue into our next topic. So um, I'll just throw it out to the panel. Feel free to jump in. Um, can you all provide some additional examples of how I can engage in providing input into new standards and development? So not so much what CMS necessarily prescribes or ONC uh, prescribes that we have to do, but uh, if you're a stakeholder out there um, or an EHR company or whatever, how, do you, um, how can you provide input? I think there are um, three ways, potentially maybe even more. Um, one is through HL7. Um, CMS, ONC, HHS has various representatives at HL7 to move the standards forward. And many of you are probably thinking, okay, it's geeks and engineers that are in looking at the database and terms and attributes. I think we spend maybe 75% of our time talking about healthcare delivery, how it's delivered, processes, challenges, opportunities. And there's a way to engage without spending lots of money uh, because there are calls and you dial a 1-800 number and you get online. So, um, and you get to meet and interoperate with other people that um, are trying to solve similar things that you're trying to solve. Um, in addition to that, the SNI framework, um, they look for use cases, they look for examples. 
Um, we can always, in a room, you know, the age old, you can develop something in a vacuum where you can pull additional people in. So they spend a lot of time talking about processes and, and workflow challenges. And I think another area is to do pilot testing. Um, I'm working now on a few sites with de novo pilot testing with the uh, pressure ulcer measure. Um, small scale, uh, the site is learning. They're able to interoperate with um, experts in the area, and you can do the pilot testing without, um, quote unquote, uh, breaking the, the system that you currently have. So that's another area. And, and I think for community hospitals, um, you know, typically when we reach out to do pilot testing, it's the, the big, large organizations. Uh, it's not necessarily the practices. The IRB study that I spoke to was, is one of the pilot test sites. Um, and community hospitals, so pilot testing may be another area. And, and obviously doing research, um, but the, the three that I mentioned are ways um, low cost, high value. So um, a couple other ways to do it, and uh, what Rosemary brought up were um, great ideas for people that know what HL7 is and know what uh, the SNI framework is, and that's the, the folks that are really in the know. I would say a significant proportion of the people in this room uh, have an idea about that, although I would say another proportion of the people in the room um, know, that, know about CMS, ONC, and the uh, Federal Advisory Committees. One thing many don't realize is that the public comment period during those Federal Advisory Committee meetings is just that, it's public comment. It's intended for you as an individual in this country to have a voice in what gets measured, how it gets measured, who gets measured, and why. Um, it also gives you a voice in whether something that's being measured ought to be or not be measured. Uh, these are wonderful opportunities that too few people take advantage of. I, uh, as a representative of the ANA, sat in on Health IT Standards Committee, Health IT Policy Committee, uh, multiple federal advisory committees in other areas, and organizational committees at the PCPI, which is um, uh, Physicians Consortium for Performance Improvement, Bipartisan Policy Center. These are all open meetings that anyone who has the wherewithal to speak can do so. And all too frequently, they open it up for public comments, leave it open for 30 seconds and say there are no public comments and close the lines. That really shouldn't be happening with so many involved people. So with that said, you know, to those that are in this room and those that are listening, respond. You know, when those public comments come open, make a response. You know, put your voice out there, let it be heard. Great, thank you. And just uh, real quick to piggyback on what y'all just said, uh, most of almost everything that we do and certainly related to the programs that we've uh, mentioned earlier um, comes out of our rulemaking. So we do encourage uh, folks to uh, make comments during the proposed rulemaking period. Uh, believe it or not, we go through every single comment um, Sometimes we group them to respond to them if they're all about the same idea. Uh, but we do look at them, and they do influence um, the direction that we go with, um, uh, with some of our programs. So we would appreciate that here at, uh, at CMS and ONC. Okay, uh, why don't we move on to our second uh, objective today, and we'll talk about some areas in which HIT can uh, impact care coordination. And I'll just... Uh, use the moderator's prerogative here to say, personally speaking, um, the quality measurement we discussed earlier I think is, is very important, but as a physician and someone who's, uh, you know, had to delay surgery cases sometimes early in the morning because the pre-op physical that was allegedly faxed the night before from the primary care doctor's office didn't make it there, and having the anesthesiologists and all the nurses in the operating room kind of glaring at you, uh, I can tell you that care coordination is absolutely critical. It's critical to good health care um, and quality care being provided. It's critical to cost reduction because it saves folks from having to repeat unnecessary lab tests that have already been done or x-ray uh, tests. <clears throat> and it also gives the next, the next person providing care to that patient, obviously, 
uh, the information from the prior caregiver, which they can use and incorporate in helping to uh, figure out what's happening with the pa patient and provide the best care. So having taken, uh, picked the low-hanging fruit there, guys, I'm going to turn to my experts with uh, <laughs> the harder questions. So um, are there examples of risk tools that you can uh, provide to us uh, for uh, care with respect to care coordination? and measuring a patient's risk yeah, as well. Yeah, there are quite a few risk tools that are coming out and um, based on research, um, LACE, uh, the CARS tool, D2S2. Um, but at a higher level, research is showing that most of those tools are um, um, two areas of, of future development are, are needed related to the tools. One is um, have, having the tools targeted towards certain subpopulations, um, obviously the elderly, um, maybe somebody coming out of an intensive care unit, post-op, coronary artery bypass that had some challenges. So um, making the tools um, target certain subpopulations. And then also um, research shows that um, many of the reasons for readmission are related to social and economic factors. So having the tools um, have those data elements. I did an IRB-led study um, two years ago at a large facility um, teaching facility, and 76% um, of the readmissions at that point in time using one of these tools were related to social economic factors, um, inability to get prescriptions, uh, two stories up in an apartment, no family infrastructure, no transportation, had the appointment on their um, clinical discharge report with a date and time, but no way to get there. Um, no way to get their prescriptions, and basically um, quite a few diabetics with no way to get food into the refrigerator. So those kinds of things. So I think the tools now are moving to that next level to integrate some of those important data elements. And certainly it's a really important, obviously, as you just explained, to uh, be able to do a risk assessment at the time the patient comes into the hospital to try to identify those folks which uh, might be at risk for uh, poor discharge uh, outcome. Yeah, and I think it goes back to what the prior panel talked about in terms of um, how we're structured and, and financial incentives. Um, when we did a chart audit of the inpatient chart, those risk factors were identified. But how do you, within the four walls of a hospital, collaborate and reach out to those in the community, the home care nurse, for instance, because we follow patients from admission to the initial home care visit. And the way we're structured, um, you know, you don't typically just call up the home care nurse and say, come in or say, gee, you know, this patient may have a substance uh, dependency problem or has no way to get their medications. So the way we're structured doesn't allow for some of that communication. Thank you. Um, go ahead. You know, in Arkansas, what we're looking at as far as ambulatory care providers and what you stated regarding getting that pre-op physical, you know, you're seeing more providers that are actually doing the risk assessment now in relation to the CPC project or PCMH and stratifying those patients so that the information is out there. You know, we're looking at being able to coordinate that care and exchange that data through our health information exchanges for these providers so that the data is there for everyone. Thank you. Um, Ms. McFadden, can you also comment on what your observation or what your experience has been with respect to barriers for, uh, to improving multi multiple, uh, multiple disciplinary uh, communication, collaboration, and care coordination? With the multiple care coordination, you know, the biggest barrier is the fact that data isn't exchanged. You know, the need for data to be exchanged and readily available needs to happen. You know, we have a state HIE, but we also have areas of our state that are developing their own HIEs. And so that data won't come across to, to someone in South Arkansas if they're seeing a provider in North Arkansas. And so being able to consistently share the data across an exchange would be a phenomenal thing. Uh, Dr. Roberts, can I uh, ask you, with respect to patient education and shared decision making uh, with res in discharge planning, can you describe what an ideal IT uh, solution might look like for that topic? An ideal solution would still would be one that's really focused on what the patient wants and needs, uh, not necessarily on what we think they need. Um, kind of said that before, but that is that is the reality of it. Uh, something that's uh, that's interoperable, that's able to share the information from the hospital setting to the ambulatory setting to the home care setting in a in a very very user friendly format. 
I had a personal experience that was um, very surprising. Um, went to an urgent care center for a problem that I had, and they created a record for me. And then went back for follow-up care, and they created a brand new record, even though I was at the same center. And the reason was because the nurse that was providing the care for me at the follow-up visit, I said, why are you asking me the same questions that I had already answered previously? Oh, well, I'm just entering it into the record. I said, it's all in the record. I did this last time I was here. Oh, yeah, but it's too many clicks to get to that old record. So I'm creating a new one, then I'll merge them later when I have time. Okay, that was amazingly surprising to me. I've been in health IT for way too long to think that that should ever happen. But the reality of it is, it does happen. I would say that one of the most effective tools to use would be, uh, one of the most effective mechanisms to use would be one that's really centered around how people think and not how computers want us to think. Um, making, also making it in a language that is useful across all different areas, so physicians, nurses, patients. Um, interestingly, today in the front page of the Washington Post, which um, was fortuitous, uh, there was a story about the Open Notes Project, which has been ongoing for just over a year now. And in that project, they are giving patients at Cleveland Clinic and several other hospitals, I can't recall all, the, all of them, access to the actual provider notes uh, for, their psychiatric, for their physical care, and they're launching a project where they're giving them access to their notes for their psychiatric care. Uh, one of the comments that, a, a comment that I read that was actually across several different therapists that were involved in this was that there was a belief that they might actually have to change the way that they document so that people can actually understand what they have to say. What a great idea. Um, maybe we should be doing that anyway. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kennedy, can you, um, we would all agree, I think we've talked about it a little bit, uh, in terms of uh, interoperable electronic health records and the importance thereof, uh, particularly in support of care coordination. Can you comment on how much progress you believe has been made in the area of standards for care coordination? Um, not, not too much progress. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were saying not too much comment. <laughs> Um, uh, no, I, in all reality, with Meaningful Use, uh, progress has been made in, in the area of care coordination, but because of the business models, and maybe ACOs will kind of change that, uh, we still have a fundamental problem with exchange of information. So the primary data elements may be exchanged. I'm just thinking of a scenario based on a research study where the meds, the allergies, the problem list gets exchanged with the patient, their follow-up appointments. They walk home with a 15-page um, um, either electronic or handwritten clinical summary. Um, this is true based on the research study. The home care nurse arrives, has nothing, absolutely nothing, opens up her laptop and, and doesn't have the information in electronic form and is quickly grabbing whatever the patient has in 15 pages. Um, that has some information, it's important information related to the patient, but it doesn't have information related to the plan of care for the patient. When we analyze 30,000 data elements of what was exchanged, what the patient should do to treat their shortness of breath, their inability, their function, think about when they go home, they're the things they're dealing with. They have the medication to deal with the medical scenario. 3%, 3% of the patients actually had information related to that. When you look back in the inpatient electronic <coughs> health record, there was a wealth of information related to those conditions there was a 78% correlation between the conditions identified on the day of discharge by the clinical team and those that were identified by the home care nurse in the initial visit, although it took her an hour and a half to come up to that initial plan, 78% correlation. So I think there, we have a long way to go in terms of adding some of those data elements because there's there what people care about when they go home. How am I going to get my meds? Where are my meds? What should I do when I get up at the end of the day? 
And sometimes the, um, you know, the short inpatient stay addresses the primary medical conditions for which they're admitted for. Maybe not necessarily the immobility, the arthritis, the fact that they can't go to sleep at night unless they have a sleeping pill and they had it before and now they don't have it. There are the kinds of things that um, patients and consumers have to deal with once, once they get home. So I think there's tremendous opportunity to enhance and expand the data elements they could share. Um, so there was something that I went to a recent conference where there was a presentation by uh, VNS of New York and New York Presbyterian where they started actually rounding together. VNS of New York was sending a couple of uh, nurses, uh, two patients that were probable for discharge to home care to New York Presbyterian and were doing discharge rounds with the medical team. What a, what a great idea. And they, they were able to actually capture those points of data that Rosemary was just talking about in real time from the medical team that was caring for that patient in the hospital. And the transitions of care were so much better. The care coordination was so improved that, in fact, they found that the patients on which they rounded were significantly, I can't recall what the number was, but were significantly less likely to be readmitted than the patients that had not been rounded who were discharged with similar diagnoses to a similar setting of care. Uh, that was, for New York Presbyterian, a, a choice that was, that was uh, very, very challenging for them to bring the, the nurses in from VNS to do this, but worthwhile. For VNS, it was expensive at first to send that nurse in because it wasn't actually billable time. But having said that, that capability of rounding and bringing that information to the nurses before they were seeing that patient for the first time ultimately saved VNS time and saved New York Presbyterian time and money. Uh, these are the types of things that you know, once, once the funding ended for that project, that, syst that ended as well. But these are the types of things that really ought to become part of our learning healthcare system and part of what we start to do regularly. Thank you. Um, I think uh, moving on to the next uh, topic, we all know that there are uh, gaps in terms of follow-up uh, care after a person's discharged. Um, particularly, um, and also gaps in care sometimes with chronic disease management, uh, again, after discharge, and we know the importance of, of timely follow-up. Uh, telehealth technology has varied effectiveness, I think we'd agree to that. But uh, Ms. McFadden, can you tell us how telehealth providers and HIT experts can improve these programs? Sure. Arkansas right now has more than 75 access points for telehealth. 25 of these being specific to our ANGELS program and the RSAVES program. However, the issue that we run into is reliable connectivity. Now, we have several access points where they can log on and actually begin a conversation or an assessment, but the connectivity is not sustainable. And so moving towards a more reliable connected network is probably the best option and the biggest gap for us. Thank you. Any other? Okay. Uh, so let's move on to, oh, go ahead, Dr. Kennedy. Just another thought related to that, which I um, was thinking when, when Daryl was talking. You know, we have a lot of provider data, not necessarily related to telehealth, but right. certainly um, a consideration. We have provider data, you know, clinicians and every member of the clinical team entering data. We have administrative data and financial data. Um, the gap that we have that we don't, where we don't have data are patient-reported outcome data. So um, this one research study, um, um, cardiac patients, um, open heart and um, cabbage patients, coronary artery bypass patients, and quite a few we went into their home. Um, I, I can't say with empirical evidence, but it tends to be mostly male populations, somewhat in their 50s and 60s. And um, they had Fitbits and they had their Excel spreadsheets with their patient reported outcome data. And um, it was, they were using that, you know, in terms of their pain level, how many s steps they took, and um, they thought that the nurse could easily integrate that within the electronic health record, and even more so wanted the surgeon to see that for their post-op appointment because they were uh, quite pleased with the fact that they were making significant progress. So this area of integrating patient-reported outcome data, I do know that there is a... Um, um, effort underway to harmonize patient reported outcome data with data that are in the electronic health record so we could assimilate that information and pull it into the electronic health record. 
Just one, one comment on telehealth. Um, and I think it's a, there's a cultural issue associated with it that some people actually see uh, going through uh, a portal of some kind, going through uh, the telephone or um, Skype or whatever to see their provider as a lower level of care. Um, that is really something that if that culture exists anywhere within the healthcare provider community, we need to change because care provided by an expert is care provided by an expert, regardless of the medium through which it's done. And as our technology improves, we're finding that it is um, very excellent care. Uh, folks with pacemakers, for instance, really couldn't live, literally couldn't live without telehealth that allows the the telephone system or the um, computer system to adjust their pacers in real time. Um, something, something that I think is just, just an amazing thing and there really needs to be a cultural shift at the provider level around that. Thanks, let's uh, move on to our third objective um, and that has to do with defining e-measure and explaining how using e-measures <clears throat> can reduce uh, nur nursing workload uh, in quality measurement and the value of implementing um, the measures at uh, ND and NQI participating in acute care hospitals. So Dr. Roberts, um, CMS has uh, addressed the implementation of 113 e-measures of clinical quality. Um, what do they add and why should providers be interested? So one of the things that the e-pressure ulcer measure and uh, Rosemary can address this, I think, a little bit more expertly. One of the things that the e-pressure ulcer measure provides is the ability to put quality measurement at the point of care without taking nurses away from providing quality care to do it. Uh, it's actually able to capture the data directly from the EHR instead of using one or, or more FTEs to go in and do an assessment and document that assessment in a different place than they would originally have documented it. Um, the e-pressure ulcer measure is getting to that point and actually has shown um, fairly high, extremely high reliability and validity in that. Uh, the, the mechanism through which the NDNQI captures the data currently uh, prior to the implementation of this measure was to actually go through a, in a different process and look at every patient in the hospital and determine who had a pressure ulcer at that point instead of looking at what's actually being measured by the nurses every day on their shifts. Rosemary, you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I think going back to the point of, of the e-measure, um, first of all, research shows that facilities spend for a particular measure as much as $400,000 trying to do chart, aud chart audits to, to get the information. Stored in, in different locations using different uh, labels for a similar semantic concept. So um, to give you a concrete example um, related to falls, um, organizations may have 1,600 terms related to how a body moves. And I didn't think it was humanly possible to have that many terms in an electronic health record. And when you look at them, a lot of them are synonyms for the same concept. So with the e-measure with pressure ulcers, it reduces that. It streamlines the documentation on the front end. Everybody's speaking the same language. So the information can be shared between the nurse and the primary care physician. And because it uses a common infrastructure of meaningful use, quality data model, SNOMED terms, this common core infrastructure that can be defined within the organization, um, then we can ship that information from acute care to home care to long-term care, because we're all using a common infrastructure. That reduces the amount of time that it takes to document at the point of care, and quite frankly, facilitates communication without me picking up the phone. I put it in the system, the system sends it off to the wound care nurse if the patient is at risk for pressure ulcers. They automatically show up without me making phone calls. And using, using that common backbone infrastructure reduced the cost of documentation. But, you know, as a registered nurse, I don't mind putting the data element in if it's working for me, and there it's working for me, because someone else gets that data element. It shows on a quality report real time, and I don't have to wait six months later for somebody to go through and do manual chart audits um, to provide a quality report for that specific indicator. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McFadden, 
Do you think the uh, e-measure pressure ulcer will work with all EHRs, or is it limited, you think, more to one or two systems? Well, I think that eventually it will work with all EHRs. You know, right now we're seeing it with three specific systems currently, but if it's on a utilizing a standardized um, nomenclature and standardized workflow, why wouldn't it be available to everyone? You know, why couldn't you implement this information into a structured format within a system? You know, it should be able to abstract the data and document the data at the point of care. Thank you. So I think uh, in, in an effort to leave a little bit of time for questions, um, let's move on to our last objective uh, just briefly and we'll talk about the multiple quality uh, initiatives and their impact across the continuum of care. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about measure alignment. Um, I'll start off with ambulatory. As I mentioned uh, at the outset, um, I'm sure many of you are aware of the physician quality reporting system uh, as well as meaningful use. We have uh, at CMS tried to align these two programs, particularly from the quality measure uh, assessment standpoint. The measures are the same in both programs, albeit there are more measures that are reported via other ways in the PQRS system. But the electronic measures uh, are the same in both programs. The PQRS system data is what will be used for the value modifier program, so for individual uh, eligible professionals. Uh, additionally, we are moving toward allowing uh, group practices, or we are allowing group practices to report uh, using uh, certified EHR technology. So that is another way we are moving to try to, again, bring the programs together. Um, <clears throat> I think that's probably it. We've, you've heard us talk about uh, our efforts to not only align the measures, but to uh, push for interoperability uh, by recognizing uh, different HL7 standards. Um, and we are uh, having value sets that are available uh, for folks to review. We're trying to uh, streamline this process, recognizing particularly for our vendor communities, the amount of work that goes into uh, developing or implementing, I should say, one electronic health uh, record measure. Uh, at the same time, we're also cognizant that our um, electronic measures for the ambulatory setting are more skewed, if you will, toward um, primary care. Um, we are looking to try to expand the number of available uh, ECQMs uh, to other specialties, but again, that will be something that occurs in the future, hopefully not the too distant future, which will enable um, folks that are using uh, EHRs but uh, are specialists or subspecialists perhaps to at least report some of their measures directly from their EHR. Um, uh, so Dr. Kennedy, do you want to talk about acute care hospitals in this respect? Yeah, I think on the acute care side, um, it, it's a challenge for organizations as I work with them, as I look at the wealth and breadth and depth of, of quality measures. Um, trying to identify those that um, are most relevant and of highest priority. And I think the National Quality Strategy and Meaningful Use has certainly provided guidance in that area. I also think, um, and, and I had no, um, this is not a commercial, I was not involved in developing the um, our quality measure clearinghouse, but certainly organizations use that as, as a certain condition or phenomena. Let's say they're looking at um, CMS measure 110 for VT. Oh, I can't believe I have the measure memorized. 110 for VT. <laughs> There's help for and, that after the conference. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, you know, as, a, as a, we look at that measure and integrating within the electronic health record, and obviously it's important for the organization, then we can go to ARC, look at the clearinghouse, and we can see what other measures are related to that phenomenon because VTE care is very important for the organization. So they, they tend not to, when they get the C levels around the table, think CMS at 110, they tend to think, what are we doing for this population of patients that we want to improve care? So I think um, just in terms of tools, until we get there at a national level, I think the ARC website, um, from there we move to the tools um, developed by um, HHS, CMS, and ONC. Uh, we pull down the um, data element catalog, you get all the information you need, the National Library of Medicine, and you may be surprised that it, it's not that difficult, you know, uh, with some of the tools that are out there. Would it be nice to have someone give you a, a one-pager? Yes, mm -hmm. but um, between ARC, um, I can't tell you how valuable the other tools, we use the data element catalog, uh, we go in with the um, HQMF, the human readable form of the measure, and everyone has a conversation, 
and then we move to um, the National Library Medicine and the Value Set. So um, providers in the, in the audience could um, disagree, but we're able to kind of follow that path until we get to this, you know, um, hit the F7 button and get everything you need in terms of priority. All right, so measures. real quick, what's measure 64? I'm sorry. I'm oh, just kidding. Just <laughs> <laughs> no, no, don't, real, don't really tell me if they're... <laughs> real, <laughs> really quick add-on to that is... Um, uh, ONC, CMS, and several other organizations have put together Kaizen work groups to try to improve their processes. One of the unintended outcomes of that, a very positive one, is that you've got the measure developers from across the spectrum sitting down together talking about improving processes and also sitting down and talking about what ought to be measured. And some of the things that are coming out of there are very exciting because there's huge agreement that we have to figure out a way to measure care coordination in a much more effective way that includes every discipline associated with it. Thank you. So, go one, ahead. One other, um, in reference to um, some of the the tools and the infrastructure that we have, I think some some facilities are not aware of it, but. Um, as opposed to challenging and questioning what has been structured in terms of data and codes for the quality measures, taking into consideration the um, uh, healthcare quality measure format, I had an organization last week challenge why the guidance and the recommendation sections were not structured within the data characteristics of the, um, of the HQMF. So I do think, despite some of the pushback, um, despite I was shocked to hear um, the other day that 80% of, of hospitals uh, won't make attestation. Um, I'm in facilities and they're using some of these tools and, and they're moving, moving forward. They're actually changing, which I think Meaningful Use was intended to do. They're taking the guidance in the recommendation section and adding it to their own protocols and um, asthma with um, children. I think that's measure okay. 26. <laughs> By the way, there'll be a test on the measure numbers yeah. after. So if y'all want to just start taking it. Um, Ms. McFadden, you get the last word, so uh, we'll ask to be a little bit brief in the interest of leaving 10 minutes for questions. Can you talk to us from your QIO uh, experience about Medicaid populations, certain, any state initiatives that you're aware of, and how we can prepare small and rural providers um, uh, for long-term quality improvement? First thing I'll say is align the measures. You know, with the state-specific measures, you're looking at uh, different measure demographics than you are for the NQF measures or the PQRS measures. And so when we are working with providers and practices to attempt to align these measures, it makes it a little more difficult, especially when you're dealing with a rural population provider who does not have a care manager, they can't afford to hire a care manager, and they're dependent upon the income from the incentives or, you know, avoiding the penalties to keep their practices open. So it makes a lot of sense for us to walk in and be able to say, okay, well, when you're talking about measure 110, that's actually PQRS measure 110, which is the uh, influenza vaccination. And so looking at how to align enough of the measures that they can get credit for meaningful use, that they can get credit for episodes of care, that they can get credit for PCMH or CPC within our state. Thank you. And by the way, that was measure 110 for those of you above the Mason-Dixon line. Sorry, it was a little southern accent. You Oh, sorry. It's too early to One talk ten. about the Ravens like I do on One the national ten. provider call. All right, so well, I, I really want to thank our uh, esteemed panel for their wonderful insight. Uh, I see Beth kind of hovering in the side there. Do we have a few minutes for questions? So uh, if anybody in the audience has any questions, uh, please step up to the microphone and have at it. Or if not, we'll talk for another 10 minutes and talk about the measure numbers. Any questions? <laughs> uh, just quickly, uh, perhaps one answer to some of the challenges in the alignment of qualities would be to give providers more flexibility on what they have to report until there is sufficient alignment. So instead of having the burden of perhaps trying to be as expert as uh, Dr. Kennedy, uh, which is probably a challenge for most. It would be, especially in the context of trying to meet some of the reform goals to allow a certain amount of flexibility. That's a, a great suggestion. And <clears throat> while it's a little bit tricky from an EHR standpoint because of the required e-specifications for transmission of the measures, 
um, at least from a quality measure standpoint in our PQRS program, we do have the quali uh, qualified clinical data registry option where those uh, registries, if selected, they can report up to 20 non-PQRS measures, which again has the benefit of caregivers measuring what they think is important to their quality of care. Uh, I think in the future, as the tools are better in terms of developing and implementing uh, EHR measures and e-specifications, we'll get to that point, but I don't think we're quite there yet. Sir. Scott Mace with Health Leaders Media. What's the timetable for all of this alignment of quality measures? I hear a lot of work is going on, but I don't hear a lot of discussion of when we can expect um, the end result. Uh oh, I think that might bounce back to me. Look, Dr. Roberts, you want to take a shot? <clears throat> when it happens. Um, <laughs> the, I know that uh, CMS it, um, just renewed the uh, MIDS project, uh, the Measure and Instrument Development System project, which is a five-year project that is putting $800 million into measure development. It was originally a $500 million project, but they bumped the budget up to $800 million because they discovered that this is not only not easy, but it's also quite expensive to do. The fact that the MIDS project is on its second five-year uh, stint indicates to me that no one's really sure what the timetable is, but I would say that if we were to ask the patient community about what that timetable ought to be, you would find that the timetable's already passed. We need to get to work. I think also, um, you know, to get to perhaps, and I'm making up the number, a 90% alignment is probably achievable in the not horribly distant future to get to 100% is gonna be a long, long time coming. And you know, look, I don't have to tell you guys, you know, some of the challenges we face, like we have a cholesterol measure, which was designed only for EHRs. Well, that was great. But the, um, the guidance um, behind the, the information, the guidelines, actually changed. So now we have a measure in um, meaningful use and PQRS that are using the old guidelines. So what do we do? Well, we're, we've developed a new measure, but do we put it out to the, to the EHRs and say, hey, you know, you've got to implement this because the guidelines are changed. And, you know, back it up to the beginning of 2014 because the guidelines have changed. Well, that's not fair to the EHR developers and vendors. So it's really a challenge. I mean, and tomorrow, if a blockbuster drug came out for cholesterol management and we had, you know, you should be prescribing either one of the following meds, A through G, but this one's like L, but it's a blockbuster and it has no side effects, how do we get that into your EHR system in real time so the docs who are doing the right thing by prescribing the new blockbuster, um, you know, can get credit? Because if they prescribe the, measure, the medicines in the old measure, they'd be looking like poor performance. So it's really... It's a, it's a tricky situation, not only for us, but for the EHR vendors partic in particular, because you've got to update, roll out, you know, and that's after we publish new specifications. So it is a bit of a challenge with this alignment. You bring up a great point. Thank you. Hi, uh, John Dodd from CSC. A question about uh, uh, health, <clears throat> health measurement alignment steps. Uh, it seems like it could be done with a very set of basic, basic measures that go across if we had a health ecosystem, some intermediate and some advanced measures, and, and, and is there a, a plan for the, how that alignment can be done over the next three to five years? Uh, it's kind of a roadmap for it. I, I, I can't speak for HHS, but I do know as part of the MIDS proposal, um, it's, it's not just measure development, but it's looking at the existing measures and making some practical recommendations about how to group them and identify gap areas. So I don't know, that could very well address it. And there are, there are, other, there are other projects ongoing. Um, at my, uh, my newly minted job at Econometrica, I'm on several projects, one with Partnership for Patients, where we're looking at innovative ways of, of capturing quality, uh, of providing quality care. And once, these, these innovations are taking place in other countries where they have integrated systems that allow them to measure the same thing the same way ac across the entire country. Um, s most of these countries are the size of American states, so it makes it significantly easier to, to make that alignment happen. Also, many, some of them are uh, command economies in the healthcare sector, which makes it even easier. We won't pay you unless. Um, 
the American system just isn't designed like that, I don't, I don't know that we're going to hit all the necessary steps to make that alignment happen across the board, particularly when you have a large number of physicians graduating medical school now they are choosing not to accept insurance. Therefore, they're not going to get the incentives. Uh, you have a large number of providers that aren't interested in the Medicare population or the Medicaid population, so they're not going to get the incentives and aren't going to be driven by it. So perhaps a mechanism that uses something other than financial incentives to get quality to improve might be one that would be more effective. So there, could, there are some value chains, and we talked about diabetes, we talked about other areas. There's a few key ones that have to be done. Surgery, maybe we don't have to do everything. Maybe it's, a, you know, 20 20 percent of the... Well, I, I mean, there are certainly some generally applicable measures that we would all agree are important to, to measure. Cigarette smoking, cessation counseling is an easy one that any you know, provider or health caregiver can do. But you'd be surprised the pushback we get from some of the specialists. You know, why should I inquire about whether my patient smokes? You know, I don't understand that. I'm an OBGYN, so I'm not even necessarily primary care. You know, but we get a lot of pushback from other folks. So we're working on it, though. Thank you. We have time for one more? Or? Sure. All right. Last question. I'm last sorry, question. Jim Christina from APMA. You mentioned the Qualified Clinical Data Registry, which is a, a great tool for both having other measures other than PQRS measures and for it gives us the ability to test some of these measures and get data, which would be helpful if we want to go for NQF endorsement. However, what we're finding is that the vendors are putting an incredible cost on implementing the non-PQRS measures into their software for our members to utilize and report to the QCDR. Is there, how do we get around that? Because we're going to have these quali qualified clinical data registries that we develop have great measures in them, but nobody's going to sign up for them because they're not going to spend thousands of dollars with their vendor to be able to report to a QCDR. Yeah, unfortunately, of course, I think you know the answer. We can't control necessarily what they charge. But I would suggest that, you know, having worked on registry reporting with PQRS from its inception, mm -hmm. there are a lot of registries out there. There are s several that applied that didn't become QCDRs because they were basically software vendors and not necessarily partnered with a specialty organization or a regional collaborative or something of that nature. So, you know, uh, competition is... Uh, what helps well, to drive these things. Yeah, but it's not the QCDR vendor or the registry vendor. It's the EHR vendor. I that, see. I'm sorry. To, to actually put the uh, e-specifications into their EHR so it collects the data and then reports it to the QCDR. Right. Uh, don't have a really good one for you there, except, again, same principle in terms of, of competition. If there are enough of a particular type of specialty using a particular EHR, I would think, and again, I don't want to speak for the HRs, I would think it would be in their best interest to, to facilitate their, or uh, help their customers. Thanks. Thank one you. Of the, one of the things that I heard from an EHR vendor uh, that I've spoken with recently was that if the federal government makes me do it, I'll do it to the minimum that I'm required to do it by the federal government. If the client pays me to do it, I'll do it to the maximum of what that client's willing to pay. So it's, again, cultural. If we get ourselves, our, our provider community, to really embrace improving clinical quality as a, an element of excellent care, and we start actually doing it with our pocketbooks instead of through our regulators, I think we're going to find that the vendors are going to be much more likely to incorporate that into their systems. It's going to cost us money at first, but I do think that the outcome would be improved care. Great. Thank you all. Um, Beth's got a couple quick announcements. I just quickly want to thank uh, Drs. Kennedy and Roberts and Ms. McFadden for their expertise in agreeing to uh, participate on our panel today. Ms. Myers. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, just wanted to let everyone know it is lunchtime. Uh, the cafeteria, if you head out towards the main lobby where you came in and down the stairs, it is on the lower level directly below there. 
you can also head off campus. There are some restaurants around. Um, I know Niall mentioned the barbecue place. Um, but do remember that you need to plan for that time to get back in through security as you come back in because you will have to come back through the, uh, the drive security. Um, we will begin promptly at 1 o'clock, so please do return on time. And we will start then with our Information Governance for Healthcare panel. Thank you.